Throughout history, free thinkers have outraged the religious with their wacky ideas about the virtues of free speech, reason, and of course, eating babies. Now, God is dying, and it's time to dispose of his remains. From the pits of hell, Satan sends two puppets of the imperialist West and the Zionist Jews against God, Islam, and tiny kittens to bring you their propaganda and conspire for a new world order. This is Secular Jihadist for a Muslim Enlightenment with Ali Rizwi and Armin Navabi. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Secular Jihadists for a Muslim Enlightenment. My name is Ali Rizvi, and I am uh, one of the hosts of this podcast. Uh, the other host of this podcast, his name is Armin Navabi. He is the author of Why There Is No God and the founder of the largest online platform for atheists, agnostics, secularists, etc. in the world with over 2.2 million uh, members. It's uh, Armin Navabi. Armin Navabi. 2.3. Um, Hey. Hello. Okay, okay let them know. Jesus. Let them know. <laughs> After that entire introduction, the guys are like, hey, you didn't do good enough. <laughs> okay, there you go. All right. Thank you. Yeah, okay. A little gratitude. Uh, for those of you watching me, excuse my COVID beard. This is the sap and this grew out. I kind of like it now. It's a little nice to see, but it's okay. It doesn't matter. Oh, my um, God. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, this is not good, right? It's a bad start already. We have uh, today, um, we have a white person as our guest. <laughs> okay, sorry. No, maybe I should post for <laughs> That's yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm I, okay. I don't know what to do about that. But here, so we are speaking today <laughs> uh, to a. Um, so this is going to be really interesting. We're speaking to Susanna M. Uh, she is a former Catholic. And she was raised in a very sort of conservative We're Catholic household. Catholic. Recovering ex-Catholic. Recovering ex-Catholic. Mm. Uh, and she was a former radical far leftist. So she was a member of the far left. Uh, member, as in, but part of the far left. And she was an Antifa affiliate. Uh, and she was de-radicalized because of you know several reasons. Uh, one of the prominent ones being exposure to ex-Muslims. Um and uh, she credits ex-Muslims and a lot of things that she read and heard from ex-Muslims uh, for helping her out of this kind of dogmatic thinking and for embracing skepticism. So, um, first of all, Susanna, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. You know, I was going to say that I was a little sad that Faisal wasn't here to give me one of his classic wildly inappropriate intros, but I think that will do. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah. I tried, but... All I could do is call you a white person. I guess that's Racist. inappropriate enough. I've yeah, I know. I don't see color. Well, I have no idea. What I, I, no, I'm just joking. I tried to <laughs> do one of Ali's color. jokes, but I'm not that good at it. So just yeah, you're not a dad yeah, yeah. yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be a dad. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that happens to you. Once your those testosterone levels drop, when you <laughs> become domesticated, <laughs> that's... Uh, Right. It's true. It happens. It's been shown. All right. Let's so, ask. So anyway, yeah, okay, yeah. sorry guys. This is a very serious topic. Okay. And uh, so, so Susanna, uh, when we reached out to Susanna, I, I asked Susanna for some, um, uh, just some bullet points, things that she wanted uh, me to prioritize when I introduced her, and she sent me this outline that was actually amazing because it's a lot of it is just her entire story, and she's really looked into it. Uh, she's been very introspective and, and figured out her process and how it happened. And I think it's kind of, it's really amazing that we're going to be able to get into this today. So Susanna, first of all, let's start with your childhood, how it all started. You grew up in a in a Catholic household. What was that like and how did that inform the kind of person that you are today? Oh my God. Um, so I think it's worth noting that both of my parents converted to Catholicism. Um which is not typical in most of the other Catholic kids I grew around. It was more of a family heritage and cultural tradition, um, maybe from, you know, an imperialist kind of colonial influence. Um, but this is something my parents actively chose. Um, when, yeah, when I was very young. Um, and it 
did a number on me. Um, <laughs> I, when I talk about how it affects my life to this day, what is reflected back to me is people are like, oh, that sounds like some religious trauma. Um, it really affected um, my ability to think of myself as worthy um, in certain areas. And um, I think it, I, I mean, I was, the vast majority of my education was Catholic um, and Catholic private schools. And so it was just very indoctrinated. Um, and there are certain Catholic themes that I think lent itself towards the path that I eventually went down. Um, both in terms of my intense reaction in opposition to the tradition I was raised in, and also these kind of Catholic themes of um, suffering for a greater good and self-sacrifice and martyrdom, um, I think also kind of primed my brain to really um, pick up on those um, yeah, kind of grand themes and other types of ideologies. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, you said in your, and the thing that you sent me, and this is, I'm going to quote you, you said, I was raised so Catholic that I didn't <laughs> know I was Catholic. You said, I was raised so Catholic yeah, that yeah, I didn't yeah. know I was Catholic until I was 14. Right. And that actually, I think that is something that so many ex Muslims are going to relate to. Mm -hmm. Wait, so, 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 does are... that, so f just to be clear, so that means that you're, you, you believe that this is so much that the norm is that there's no other way, like, like, is that, is that why you didn't believe that you didn't know that you were a Catholic? Like, how does that work? Kind of like I had gone to school and there were, I mean, primarily Catholic schools and there were other people of other traditions in my school. So I knew that other religions and stuff existed. You know, I had Jewish friends and so forth, but I didn't understand that I was specifically Catholic until I took a Western civilization class and mm -hmm. we learned about the uh, Counter-Reformation and the Reformation in Martin Luther. Right, it's kind of like and, the de facto. The mm -hmm. de facto Yeah, it was religion. like, right. oh, everyone who's a Christian isn't Catholic? Mm -hmm. Like, I had, I had awareness of that when we were traveling and we couldn't find a Catholic church, we go to a different type of church. My... Um, grandma on my father's side was um my half of my family's from the south so you know they're kind of a more pentecostal baptist methodist vein um but it wasn't until i was yeah freshman in high school that i understood explicitly that this is my family's specific mm. tradition right it was just like this is what it is. It was so, um, I don't know, maybe assumed, maybe they thought I understood it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah and you, you called yourself a cradle Catholic as well. Right? I mean, oh yeah. So, um, that comes from my grandpa because it's kind of funny. Um, a lot of my mom's side of the family has also later in life converted to Catholicism. So my grandparents were Protestants until um, they converted to Catholicism and they took their catechism classes the same year that P Pope Francis became the Pope. And I remember my grandpa telling me, he's like, you're so lucky that you're a cradle Catholic, meaning you were a Catholic from the cradle. Like, mm. since you were born, this is your tradition. Like, um, yeah, mm. it's what I was raised in. It's everything I know. Yeah. yeah. There's... There's a, so there's another really important element of this, and, and the, the reason I'm asking By the way, Ali, before you go on, I do want us to move to the Antifa stuff soon. We, uh, yeah. we have a, it's a podcast. On I know, it. I know, we but I just want to make sure that we do like 90% on that we, we, uh, and only 10% on this Catholic and, stuff. Okay, okay. Inshallah, inshallah. inshallah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, inshallah, inshallah we Inshallah, Iblis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> inshallah, mm -hmm. Darwin. So... Uh, you, there's another important element of this, and, and again, the reason I'm bringing it up is because uh, this is stuff that has a lot of parallels with the experiences of ex-Muslims that, that we're mm -hmm. all used to, that many of us have lived, 
um, and especially a lot of our guests have gone through. Uh, you also grew up bisexual in a in in your conservative Catholic family, and this was something yeah. you said LGBT was just not supported in your family. Mm -hmm. um, it was discouraged, punished, and uh, but uh, did you know the entire time? And well, I, I'm assuming you did. And if you did, how how did you live with that? How did you deal with it? Um. Well. Ever since I was little, I've never been good at being a lady, and I've never been good at... Oh, man. neither have I. Um, I've never been good at being proper, like, it's funny if you look at baby pictures of how my, I'd be dressed up for, like, holiday occasions, I was like a little baby doll and, like, patting with their shoes, and then you look at other pictures of me where I have my shirt off with my shirt around my head, and then, like, I'm covered in marker like half naked you know so that's who I really was and um I didn't have a clarity around my sexuality until I was probably 14 or 15 and that's when I realized that like the intense emotional feelings I had towards my best friend were not actually friendship um and I was like, oh, wait, no, I feel a different type Sorry, of... what age? Like, um, I'd say 14, 15 years old. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, entering high school. Um, and I already knew that it was something that needed to be kept under wraps. Um, mm -hmm. Even though it wasn't something that was often a top of, topic of conversation in our family... You know, you internalize all these messages as a little kid, so you already know what's kind of on the table for discussion. Um, yeah, and I just didn't feel or have reason to believe that being open about those feelings or what I was starting to question about myself would be um, that I would be able to be vulnerable enough to express that. Yeah. yeah. So, so what happens from here, and then now we're going to get to what Harmon wants to get to is the mm -hmm. of the your sort of far left radicalization. Are you, how, how did that? You say that you know being raised Catholic like kind of set you up for failure, and it made you vulnerable uh, to influences. More, can you go into that and just explain that a little bit? Hello? Oh, shit. Hey, guys, my computer is freezing a little bit. Can you guys uh, hear me? Just a second. Um, please, in the live chat, tell me what's going on, if there's anything. I don't know what's happening with my computer. He's on a PC, you know. Okay. It's not like us Mac people. I can hear you guys. Again. <laughs> I've triggered there it. There you go. <laughs> okay, good. Anyway, go ahead, Susanna. Sorry. Um. Sorry, what was your question? Well, the question is uh, that uh, you said that it set you up for failure and it made mm -hmm. you more vulnerable to influences, that kind of indoctrination, um, dogmatic indoctrination. So I, I, I just wanted you to kind of expand on that and uh, talk about how that eventually what that means first of all and how that led you to the the far left antifa ish mm -hmm. um, rabbit hole yeah so part of what it teaches you and this is something that you guys talk uh, touch on a lot is that you're not taught to value things based on what's true or not true you're taught to value things based on how they make you feel and um, when I was discovering this part of myself, my reaction was to basically, um, <laughs> my therapist says my reaction was to burn down the church, meaning like in my head, the only way that I could cognitively survive in a faith that taught me that I was going or likely going to go to hell was to burn down the entire tradition itself. So I wasn't 
um, a very easy person to get along with in my adolescence at all. <laughs> um, yeah. And that further led me to really reject um, tradition and um, oh god damn it I don't know how to fix this right now one second guys sorry about this this is such an important episode so I'm really pissed that this is happening one second My computer, it's my computer, I think. It's not the connection. The connection is fine. Um, this might be a good time to tell you guys that if you could, if you guys are a Patreon, it's going to help me get yeah, better. Oh, sh oh, I know what's happening. I know what's happening. <laughs> okay, Ar Armin, can you just, uh, just let her talk? Oh, figure it out. There he is. No, there guys, if I back. can't hear you, okay, it's fixed. I know what happened. I know what happened. I fixed it. Um, the reason why I need to talk when that happens is because if I can't hear you guys, the live chat doesn't doesn't hear either. Oh, but you can hear us. Okay. Yeah. So it's fixed now. It's not going to happen again. I figured it out. All good. All good. Sorry okay, but about yeah, that. Yeah, the, the live chat, they were saying the audio was coming through okay. The video was lagging. but No, that was delayed. That's, when I don't hear you guys, the live chat won't hear you. The, uh, yeah, but oh, it's okay. fixed now. It's fixed now. I know what oh, I okay. Mean. Okay. All right, Susanna. Sorry. Sorry about that. Won't happen again. No worries. <laughs> but yeah, go ahead. Um So yeah, because when you're taught that such an inherent part of yourself is so bad, like the only way that I could continue to move forward cognitively was to yeah, essentially burn tradition to the ground rather than being burned at the stake, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if I wanted to be, like, very hyperbolic about it. Um, and that, in turn, led me to just have um, a very reactionary response to being surrounded by these traditions or people who were conservative or people who were not very accepting and tolerant. And... I mean, like any other young adult, I wanted to find people who would protect me. I wanted to find people who would um, allow me or be safe enough to have be vulnerable around them. I wanted to feel validated in my identity. And um, I wanted to have, yeah, a sense of belonging and purpose. I mean, and these the the left is who is supposed to do that for me right and um so that led me down that path and then yeah a combination of different things definitely made me you know go even further left um do you want me to get into that now yes sure yeah please yeah so i think one of the things that really began to set me off was um yeah, so that was kind of like the background. So I was already had a proclivity of just like shooing off tradition of um, not liking anything right wing and conservative because that had a very specific meaning to me. And then when Donald Trump was elected, I it, it felt so threatening, like it did to a lot of people. It felt really threatening um, to my identity, to the people I cared about and to lots of other communities that I'm not a part of, but that I care about. And I didn't, and then there was Unite the Right, you know, um, the murder of Heather Heyer, and, and in the Bay Area where I am, um, there's been a lot of clashes with the far right in our area that get a lot of national media attention, um, especially at UC Berkeley. And I felt like there was not enough people who were as concerned about the rise of fascism as I was, or that my peers around me were. I felt that people weren't taking it seriously, and I felt that people weren't um, taking explicit and 
drastic action to stop that from continuing and from preventing that those groups from hurting the people I cared about. Um, Mm -hmm. and in my area, who did I see presumably doing something about it was the anarchists in Antifa. Right. They were the people who were the most visibly, I mean, that could be disputed. Um, it certainly caught my attention though, organizing and demonstrating and presumably doing something about it. And I felt desperate, and they seemed to have the answers, and so I got involved. Yeah. So that's, so at that point, so it's, it's kind of like, so like your therapist said that you wanted to just burn the church to the ground. And I guess when you liberate yourself from something like that, there is a, um, there's this phenomenon, sociological phenomenon called anime. That mm-hmm. and then this is again the parallel with ex-Muslims is that many of them once they leave the religion, their entire sort of moral compass and their sense of identity is just drastically ripped out from beneath them. Exactly. And mm-hmm. so the pendulum swings the other way. Hey, that's like mm-hmm. our previous guest. They process guests. it very much like our previous yeah, guest. Yeah, yeah. But like that our would... previous guest, it's who went to Islam. Go yeah, go on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So. So in her case, you know, she became uh, a Muslim, right? So there, there are people, so you tend to, again, and a lot of it has to do, it seems, with identity, with a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose and meaning. And, and so it on. particularly has to do with when someone is at their most vulnerable. Hmm. Right. People are most vulnerable to getting involved with extremist and dogmatic ideologies when they are at a delicate place in their life hmm. right when right. um there when there is a need that is not being met they're attracted to these groups because they profess often deceptively to address those needs and to give them this individual what the state what their family what their religion what have you couldn't give them oh, i mean yeah. this is the case this is the case for people who join MS-13. It's the same thing that makes someone join a neo-Nazi. It's the same thing that makes someone become a jihadist. It's the same thing that leads someone to it join is. the Jehovah's Witness or any other destructive cult. Or, it's exactly absolutely. the same. It might also and be you know people, what? We had... But sometimes people also join yeah. as a way to, as a response, they join um, groups that are not destructive. Like people go look for something, for meaning, um, sometimes very extreme but there are like i was trying to like while you were speaking i was trying to figure like why didn't it happen to me like when i left islam islam was a big deal to me so when i left islam why didn't i go look for something like that but then i realized it's maybe because i just built my own community which is atheist like my response to leaving islam was to not look for a community but build a community well, Armin, that's very true, but I'm talking about specifically the common denominator between what drives people towards destructive groups specifically. Right. I mean, there is, if someone is lucky, the opportunity for constructive influence. Mm. But the common denominator of what makes someone vulnerable to destructive influence is a sense of certain needs but not being met and right. often a deceptive um, profession of being able to meet those needs. Hmm. Yeah, there's so and when also they, a, a lack of critical thinking. Yeah, there was a, a, a this guy I, I think it was jo- Joseph Marcia or Robert Marcia was one a sociologist who talked mm-hmm. about how people resolve their identity crises from adolescence, yeah. and he oh, defined I've been them. Your book. <laughs> oh, so oh, so yeah, I did write about it in there. Yeah. That's right. I should yeah, but oh, thank you. There you Just go. to be fair, Armin, your book is in the mail. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes, it's supposed to arrive on Saturday. Oh, that's sweet. Uh, yeah. You might find it too so basic. I... If you're you're an atheist, right? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, yeah. you might find it's mostly an introduction, so you might find it a bit too basic. But I hope you like it. Oh, I, I still loved it, though. Yeah? I, I read it. It was basic. But I, yeah, sometimes sure you have I to go. still enjoy it. Mm-hmm. We get so much into the weeds of things. Sometimes we forget all the basic stuff and how good it was. Oh, so okay. I think it's a it's a great. Uh, I, I still love that oh, book. Uh, but um, 
so yeah, again, this is in the book, but uh, mm-hmm. it was about how people resolve their identity crises, and, and he defined it in terms of exploration and commitment. So you explore mm-hmm. all kinds of different options, and the people who come from relatively open households or not super, super conservative, super, super whatever, um, and ideologically di- dogmatic, uh, they tend to be able to explore a whole bunch of different options and then commit to a set of values that they feel define them uh, through that process, at the end of that process. Um, but one of the forms called identity foreclosure in that people don't explore much. So this is what, you know, they're just taught one set of ideas and they just strongly commit to it. And then when they come out and then they see that there are all these other ideas out there, it's something they can't handle. So that's when the pendulum is more likely to swing in a way. Can you tell us a little bit more about how it was like to be part of that community and the things that you believed in and the experiences that you had? Oh, um, it's, ooh, how do I describe it? Um, it's very exciting, right? It's very thrilling to feel like you're doing what it takes to put your boots to the pavement and get something done, right? And, um, like I said, I've never been too great about rules, and I, um, partly because of my disdain for Catholicism, have a general problem with authority. (laughs) Um, it suited me Mm -hmm. well. Good. And, um, there's a general outlaw attitude to it where you really feel like you can create your own future in a way and um like one of my favorite stories as a kid was robin hood Hmm. what does robin hood do robin hood goes breaks into people's houses the rich and he goes and redistributes to the people who need it right and so here i am and I'm a young adult, and I'm thinking, like, we learned about World War II. We learned about, you know, anti-fascist resistance mm. during the Second World War. Like, we we have stories like Robin Hood. Like, why aren't more people compelled to do something about it? That it drove me crazy. I couldn't understand it. Why aren't more people compelled to put themselves on the line to mm. do something about this? It didn't make sense to me and I was surrounded with people who embodied that willingness Hmm. who felt so compelled and um it's I mean no matter what you say about it at the end of the day you will sure meet a whole lot of interesting people (laughs) from all different sorts of walks of life and very different approaches very different ideas about what's wrong with our world, how they want to fix it. Um, what are some of those ideas and the ways to fix it? Mm. Um, so a big thing is, well, like the biggest buzzword is abolish. So like pretty much anything you can think of, they want to abolish it. Mm, well, maybe that's an overstatement. Like <laughs> um, for a while, I was firmly for the abolition of all borders, the abolition of all state, Mm -hmm. um, the the abolition of gender, the abolition of um, the police force as we know it, the abolition of prison as we know it. Um, Yeah, stuff like that. And replace it with what? Um, Well... Oftentimes, the idea is to destroy hierarchy itself. So they would say, you're asking the wrong question. Why would we want to replace it with something? Why would we want to replace something that is inherently unjust hmm. with a softer version? So it's an kinda, an anarchist? So it's kind of like... Yes. Anarchist? But isn't Antifa... Yes. Of, so I, this is very confusing to me because isn't like groups like Antifa authoritarian... Isn't authoritarian the exact opposite as far as you could possibly well, get from anarchists? They don't understand anarchist? themselves to be authoritarian. They don't think they're authoritarian at all. But are they authoritarian? Because that's the opposite of anarchy, isn't it? Yes, it is the opposite of anarchy. Um, 
Oh, well, wait, it's no, wait, theoretically... No, wait, this is where the cognitive okay, dissonance comes in. Okay, yeah. go, go on. Functionally, it's not like that at all. No, okay, but, it's the, it's the, yeah, but I want to know what the groups, the the people. I don't. Re yeah, we're not asking what reality is. I want to know what these people believe in. They believe that all power should be decentralized. Mm -hmm. um, if possible, the presence of power should be better than deconstructed. It should be completely destroyed itself. Um, uh, it hinges on an idea of um, finding hierarchy to be inherently coercive, hmm. um, that um, oppression depends upon dominance hierarchies, um, uh, boy, that language can be a tool with which oppression is demonstrated. <laughs> um <laughs> Yes. Does it like seem that. to me? It seems, and I this might be because I'm consuming too. I consume a lot of content from all sides, uh, but some of the right wing con content that I consume um, has had this influence on me. And you could correct me if this is wrong. Does it seem to you like they are taking Marxism to a whole new level? Like Marxism was like, hey, let's get rid of class. And these people are saying, why just stop at class when we could get rid of a whole bunch of other things as well? Oh, like, 100%. Right, okay. Yeah. So this is basically um, Marxism on steroids. Like, not let's not just remove class, but gender, all, oh, all institutions, the definition of everything, language, borders, everything, right? Oh, yeah. For a while, I thought it um, that we should destroy i was one of those people who was like we should destroy all assumptions of gender mm. um um so, a funny little anecdote um you guys will get a kick out of this so early in january after the assassination of soleimani i went to a no war with iran demonstration in downtown and while i was there i ran into someone that i had met briefly when I was supporting the prison strike at San Quentin State Prison and demonstration there. And they recognized me and they were like, oh, you're talking to me, blah, blah, blah. I didn't know this person that well. I knew that we had mutual friends. And very quickly, they asked me, like, well, what's your political affiliation? Or, like, how do you describe your politics? And I, this was at a point where I was already starting to really question and be suspicious about a lot of things. Hmm. And I was like, oh, you know, I don't really know where I fit in right now. I'd say I'm generally left, but I think what best describes me would be skeptical. <laughs> and flat out, they're like, oh, I'm a Marxist, Leninist, Maoist. So that's like one of the most popular alignments that you see today is an MLM, Marxist, Leninist, Maoist. And yeah, wow. so it is how, on steroids. How, do these people not know history? How could they defend Mao? Like Marx? Okay, thank you. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, and Marx and Lenin, is... I get. Okay, I'm like but... okay, yeah, a lot of people like them. It's fine. Okay, but... go on. We were saying. What? Okay, anyway. And this is something that always made me uncomfortable when I was affiliating with these groups is how hardcore people were about socialism and communism. And the thing is that I'm lucky enough in the education that I got, I learned about the Cultural Revolution. I learned about the Great Purge. I read books like Red Scarf Girl and Wild Swans. And so I knew from these memoirs and these in history what the reality of those ideologies was hmm. and i became increasingly uncomfortable with how flippantly people were just throwing around these labels like at least where i live co openly calling yourself a socialist or a communist and proudly so is a very like sexy thing hmm. it's like um uh because it's so counter to what we have now and just radically being diametrically opposed to what we have now is like the sexiest thing you can be. It's very like controversial. It's very like, oh my God. Like, <laughs> and mm. that made me really uncomfortable because in all of these events that I go to, lots of different stuff, book fairs, film screenings, demonstrations, occupations, 
um, all sorts of stuff. Um, I didn't ever find anyone in my personal experience, maybe outside of my personal experience, who would talk or address the human rights abuses that happened under these regimes. Hmm. Like, I... And every now and then, I could kind of get a response, but the apologism was terrible. The worst apologetics I've ever heard. I mean, and you'll be quite familiar with this. It basically comes down to that... It, it, that's because of Western imperialism. That's because of Western meddling. You only think that because of propaganda. Um, we don't know that that's what actually happened. You is know, there anything? Is there anything that they did not blame on Western imperialism? Anything wrong no. in the world? No. 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 Nope. So nope. it's very similar to a lot of people that explain uh, that can't think of anything. But I met with a. I had some interviews with self proclaim Nazis, right? And yeah, I, 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 listen to those. <laughs> I ask uh, this self proclaimed Nazi once that can you think of anything wrong in the world that is not because of the Jews? And he ha really struggled to come up with an answer. And it seemed like this, these are the, like, these are the same kind of <laughs> answers. Like if I ask a lot of these Antifa people, can you name me something in the world that is a problem in the world that is not because of Western... Actually, you know, yeah. I'll adjust that. They will say that the problems in China are due to authoritarianism. Hmm. Not communism, though. But how is that... Oh, yeah. They're against authoritarianism. But wasn't Mao an authoritarian, though? Oh, you're starting to catch on. <laughs> Okay, is yeah, it, exactly. is it, based on your readings, do you think it's fair, I think it's fair, but do you think it's fair to say that communism is responsible for a lot more deaths than Nazism? I mean, the numbers support that, yes. Right. So, that's, and that's it, fact, so, so data. Would you, that's so, the truth. Would you say that, it's, that, so these Antifa people, I, I don't think they're, they're not really the problem because they're a fringe. What's what's a bigger problem is that they are that shows how pro, how the entire society is far from reality. Is that they are tolerated a lot more than Nazi groups. Like if you if you see a bunch of people going around with Nazi flags around, people are shocked. People are like, "Wow, these people mm -hmm. are the lowest of the mm -hmm. low." But you could have communist mm -hmm. symbols everywhere. You could have it on your T-shirt. And some people think like you're crazy, but most people tolerate it and it's accepted. I'm not saying it shouldn't be tolerated. I'm just saying like the relative to the... Uh, no, I understand what yeah, you're Yeah, relative saying. to Nazis, people don't see... The, it doesn't get the same vitriol. Right, even though he is responsible for a lot more misery. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Speaking of which... Wait, I wait, just, wait. Just no, I wanted aside. to hear that. I asked a question. I want to hear an answer. Sorry. Well, wait, 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 wait. Before, you, before you answer, I just want to say that I just called, called a neo-Nazi propagandist on, on Twitter in response <laughs> to the tweet that no. we have you on. So I was like, okay, this is Dude. our next live stream. De-radicalize yeah. from other, yeah, yeah, the yeah. same thing that I tweeted, and I just got a response. And several, actually. A mask off. You are nothing but a neo-Nazi propagandist. Scum. And then there's... <laughs> there's <laughs> Yeah, there's, wow, there's congrats. other ones too. How how many times how have you been Muslims, how many times have you been called? Oh, they're enough? Nazi masters, uh, ex-Muslims, they're Nazi masters ordered them to attack Antifa so they can kill Muslims, immigrants, leftists, and liberals with easy wow. this is why they hate Antifa. So yeah, yes. Antifa they're already I just tweeted the the thing. So how many times have you been uh, called I mean, a Nazi? Wait, wait. Go, on. Go, on. Huh? go on, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like, this was my main hesitation that I knew was coming down the pipeline hmm. with having this conversation. Because um, in terms of, well, Stephen Hassan, who I refer to heavily in conceptualizing what I've been through and what I observe, um, he, well, actually it's Robert J. Lifton, he talks about thought-terminating cliches. And so one of the critical thought-terminating cliches is anti-antifa equals fascist because it's a double negative right so yeah. as if they're anti-fascist so, i wish sorry. they were I, I as if they're anti-fascist i wish they were anti-fascist mm. but they're just mm -hmm. fascists <laughs> yeah but yeah, go they're, ahead, not, they're not ready to hear that right um yeah and it comes from again a thought terminating cliche that because you have a nuanced approach, presumably, and you disagree with Antifa tactics, you are therefore a fascist. 
Which, which is why I'm glad to have this conversation because I think it's important to point out mm. that you can be vehemently anti-fascist and not support Antifa tactics. Right. But, I mean, I already know that, yeah, I'm going to be called all, all sorts Wait, of Is this the first things. time you're openly discussing your new views? Oh, dude, this is the first time I've talked about... I've gone on the record for literally anything, let alone the most controversial part of my life. <laughs> Wait, like, so what are, okay, so what are some of the most extreme views that you had when, now that you now consider to be extreme when you were mm -hmm. affiliated with these groups? Um, definitely complete police abolition and total prison abolition hmm. were up there um did you have any I, hatred towards hmm. yourself for being white oh you have no idea tell us it's hard to even have this conversation because i can hear in my head the dozens of things that people would say against me to delegitimize and dismiss what i have to say like what like <laughs> um I have no place to talk about this. This isn't, you You shouldn't, like, shut up. You shouldn't talk about this. This isn't your issue. This isn't your group. Um, uh, you're white. I am. I come from a well-off family. I'm college educated. I have a job with benefits. I'm part of the scientist class. Um, what the I have a passion. Are, are you a scientist? Do you have a science education at all? Or? Mm -hmm. Okay, finish the list. Yeah. Um... <laughs> What else would be used to delegitimize me? Hmm. Well, um, I guess now you, for a while, I was very confused about my gender, but now I feel comfortable calling myself a woman. So I'm cisgendered. You gotta, hmm. you gotta dismiss that. Hmm. Um, what I'm else? trans. I mean, I, I identify as trans. I'm biologically cis, but I identify as trans. Okay, but how does that work? Well, I, oh, yeah. Okay, so how does why can't cis people identify as trans? Why is it so? How okay, but seriously, how, how among woke among among the woke okay. religion, how could you be privileged, like to be a woman, and also there's no such thing as a woman? Like, how could you be privileged to be like cis? I mean, cis woman, but there is no woman. How could you be privileged to be a man? And also, there's no such thing as men. Well, actually, well, I know the answer to that. Yeah. You're yeah. currently yes. operating within a matrix of domination and oppression right. that believes that there is such a construction. Right. So if you ascribe right. to such a so construction, this is, yeah. you are supporting these hierarchies of oppression. Right, right. So even though there's no I, such thing as race, you're still privileged for being white because it was an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a societal invention to be white and you're benefiting from mm -hmm. something that is made up but even though it's not it's completely yeah. fake okay so it makes sense okay, okay. And i mean it doesn't make sense but it doesn't make sense the term okay go Sorry, ahead. yeah no I, I i agree with armin it doesn't make sense and I've, I've said this before i'm like the if when they say biological sex isn't real if biological sex wasn't real you wouldn't even need terms like cis and trans but that's evident but no, anyway you're confusing two things. There's biological sex, and then there's gender, gender, gender expression, gender yeah. presentation, which are these ephemeral. I, but there are, no, no, but, I, I but there, that, but what Ali is pointing out too that there are people that are not just denying gender anymore. There are people that They're are also denying bio biological oh, yes, sex. I was almost on that bandwagon for a second. Right. I remember having a discussion in class about if it's necessary for a doctor to even know your sex within the clinical setting. Right. Um, wait, but before we move on, I want to point out something important. Um, I think the biggest thing that people would dismiss and delegitimize me on was my um, my presence and activity within these communities. So I'll be the first to admit that I was not um, a um, what's the word? I'm I wasn't a community organizer. I wasn't. Um, always at every group i wasn't um i wasn't the most diehard because like i was white? on you know sorry because of whiteness um well for a variety of reasons mm, primarily i have some chronic pain issues oh. and so that would literally physically pre prevent me from being as active as i wanted to be but to help illustrate it i'm gonna hold up something so here you can see um, for the audio listeners, it's a pyramid. 
And around the base of the pyramid, there are two rings. And this is from Stephen Hassan. And this is the his way of describing a destructive cult structure. And I don't necessarily think that Antifa, whatever you may call it, is a destructive cult, but they certainly use destructive influences. Mm-hmm. And so I still find this graph um, helpful. But I think of myself as a fringe member who was on one of these outer rings, mm-hmm. whereas the actual pyramid itself is constructed of going from top to bottom, top leaders, sub-leaders, core devotees, and rank and file members, and then illuminating outward are fringe members. Hmm. However, it's important to understand that even if you are a fringe member, like, um, say, someone who believes in Scientology, but they're just kind of a clergy member, they're not in the Sea Org, they're not part of the organization, that indoctrination and that influence is still as strong as a, on a fringe member than someone who is in the core of the pyramid itself. And the, the main difference being how tightly the um, people who are within the pyramid have a way tighter control of their physical environment than fringe members. Right. Before, Did that make sense? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Before, yeah. But before, I, at some point, we're going to go to your deconversion story and how that happened. Uh, mm-hmm. But before de-radicalization, if that's right. Uh, but and I wanted to know more. This is so fascinating because I want to know more mm-hmm. about the the belief system of the of this cult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how does it make sense for a group of people that want to break everything apart to support Islam, which is the exact opposite, that has a role for everything mm-hmm. under the sun, and they have like very specific definition of not just gender, but gender roles, mm-hmm. of sure. their anti-homosexuality, anti-trans. Um, like mm-hmm. it seems like from all the belief systems that th- this group of people should be against, Islam would be a number really one. high number, really high up there <laughs> based on if you want to break things apart, right? So how does yeah. that work? I've been thinking about this a lot lately because I'm going to be honest in preparation for doing this podcast. I basically studied like it was a college exam, right? I what? want oh, what wow. I'm saying to be founded in something tangible and have a basis in evidence or in reality. So I've been kind of reflecting and going back to, I have a whole stack of like all the materials I collected over the years. I've been reflecting and going through those again, trying to refamiliarize myself with like what this is really like. Okay. And in these pamphlets, in these zines, in these materials, there, you know, there'll always be like a list of all of the phobias that they're against, all of the systems of oppression that they're against. And Islamophobia invariably is included in that laundry list of systems of oppression that need to be abolished. And I've been thinking about this because it's so antithetical. I, I think it comes down to literally knowing next to nothing about Islam (laughs) and also um, believing that Muslims are invariably the minority and which is kind of false because it's the second largest religion in the world. Right. And oh my God, it's, I really think it comes down to really not knowing much about Islam either. I mean, I'm going to be honest, I was so woefully misinformed before I found your guys' work. It's so embarrassing. It's so embarrassing. And it's so funny because if these groups were confronted with an Islamist group, hmm. they would be decimated in seconds. Right. <laughs> they, it would not stand. Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, so- can I, I, I just want to, just for people, I know the people like that these people on Twitter were saying that, you know, they're anti-Antifa and everything. I just want to give an example of something uh, that Do it fast. initially really turned me off of them. I'll right? speak faster. Anyway, so I was saying oh my God. that a couple... Yeah. So a we couple can go years longer. Ago, yeah, no, no, I tweeted about this. I'm going to find it. I'm going to retweet it again. In, 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 uh, in Toronto, at the Pride Parade here, mm-hmm. uh, th- there were a group of um, ex-Muslim LGBT activists. Okay, so these are people who were persecuted in Islamic theocratic countries for mm-hmm. being gay and being lesbian in places where they throw you down from the rooftops, hang you up from cranes like in Iran, execute yep. you as they do in Saudi Arabia. Well, these people come up to, to 
speak out against Islamic theocracy at the Toronto Pride Parade as mm-hmm. LGBT activists. Like, they really lived a life. And they were surrounded by these Antifa people who would not let them proceed or say anything because they said, you're being Islamophobic. It was yeah. absolute insanity. And there's nothing more fascistic than that. It you know, could be expected. It, it, yeah, it is unfortunately to be expected. So I, I really don't. I, I don't understand how they're uh, they're liberal. I don't understand how they're <laughs> left. I don't understand how they're anything. Well, they're um, not liberal. You should know that yeah. there is almost nothing dirtier than you could call one of these people than yeah, calling them a liberal. liberal. Yeah, it no, is I've the heard mo- that. Yeah. No, and not because of you guys are like real ass liberals who yeah. are consistent, but because they, it is like the dirtiest thing that you can think of calling them. I remember like a family member telling me that I was too liberal when I was neck deep in this stuff. And I was like, oh, how dare you? Like, I'm not yeah. a liberal. Like, there's this saying. And the saying is, scratch a liberal and a fascist bleeds. Mm. And so mm. they believe that liberals are, it, basically they almost make no, um, they see no difference between a neoliberal and a liberal. Mm. And yeah. they see, they it's kind of this belief that either liberals are like fascists with like a nice coat of paint, or that when the proletariat comes to take their private property that they will essentially turn to fascists immediately to protect these things that they'll sell out everyone become fascists when confronted by the proletariat it's kind of that sort of attitude so, but that whole the saying confused me greatly for a long time so they, they don't believe in individualism and liberalism pr- promotes individualism and they believe that they, the reason why they don't consider themselves liberals is because they believed in equality, but forced equality. Like you don't get, you don't get to choose. Like there's nothing liberal about it, and they admit that there's nothing. They don't li- believe in equality. They believe in equity. Equity. They so. believe in leveling the playing field. They believe mm-hmm. in equality of outcome, not right. equality of opportunity. Right, right, right. Equality yeah. of outcome. Yeah, that's that's what I meant. Um, yeah, but but to do that, they don't think like. You get there by giving people choices. You just force everybody to get in line and accept their way of life. And they admit that there's nothing liberal about that and they don't want to be liberal about it. But reg- and reg- it started to confuse yeah. me more and more because these are the people who are supposedly diametrically opposed to all forms of coercion. Except theirs. They, <laughs> well, <laughs> exa- it's very inconsistent. Right. And part of what discovering your work revealed to me and part of what started to put cracks inside my cognitive walls mm-hmm. was these inconsistencies that you guys were repeatedly pointing out until my cognitive dissonance could no longer stand under the pressure. Mm. Before we move if you on, have an be- absolute- so this is opening the door to your, con- to your con- de-radicalization story. But before we go there, just one last thing about Islam. Yeah. Is it fair to say that mm-hmm. the reason why they support Islam, the two things that I could touch on, is um, one, that they see they're so Western-focused, right, mm-hmm. that if Muslims are a minority in the West, that's all they see. Like, even though they keep th- hating, the we- hating on the West, they themselves are primarily focus on what's happening in the West. Like they are, they are basically guilty of what they're blaming other people for, where uh, like they value what's happening do- in the West more than what's happening globally, right? So they don't see the fact that Muslims are majority in some places and they're uh, oppressors some, uh, in other places, most other Islamic countries, because they're just looking at their own backyard, which is in Western countries. That's one thing- To a certain extent, yeah. okay. they have, um, I mean, there's kind of a general, a big focus on um, South America and Latin America, mm. Cuba. Um, a lot of people have a lot of feelings towards what's going on in northern Syria. With um, is it pronounced Rojava or Rojava? Um, why are why the, there? Probably Rojava. Well, because they're establishing an anarchist autonomous state, oh. right? What is it? The YPG, YPK. Oh, okay. Re- oh, yeah. yeah. They're, they're, they have they they doubled into communism a lot. No, why is it? Y- and also, this y- is why. Y- this is why. Yeah, the the YPG, yes. Uh, but y- this is you. this is also why they um, they used to be very close to the more close to the Palestinian cause mm-hmm. 
before oh, obsession with Palestine. Uh, yes, and there's a lot of car like. There's a lot of communist elements so in in the early days of the Palestinian cause. Like, um, so it's, I think this is what the Hamas this is what Hamas really hurt the unity between leftists in the West and the Palestinian uh, was Hamas ruined all that because it made it more Islamic than leftist. Do you know what I mean? So before Hamas, it was very it had a very very uh, leftist paint job. So. But but what but the second thing that I thought the reason why they, they tells shows us how they could Islam defend Islam so much is that what we talked about earlier that the fact that they see all the world's problems because uh, not all of them a lot of the world's problems due to Western imperialism they don't give Muslims any agency. Uh, they don't see any agency for Muslims to to create their own problems. So take so in a way they're mm -hmm. being bigots. Because they don't see them even mature enough to be able to cause any problems. Do you see that as a one hundred and ten percent? Right. Okay. I think they don't understand. I certainly didn't understand until very recently that there is an imperialist imperialist directive within the Quran itself. Hmm. Um, there, I'm yeah. And if you believe that that is a directive of God, like I don't know how to move forward with that when in defending that if you come from this far left position um when i went to the uh, no war with iran demonstration mm -hmm. um there was not a single mention of the imperialism of iran mm -hmm. there was not a single mention of yeah shia imperialism what's going on over there like it's as if it didn't exist there was borderline open praise for Soleimani. Wow. I was, it was it was really pushing up against that edge. Lots of people saying like, you know, um, no matter what sins he may have committed, you know, this action wasn't the right thing to do. So, and I was very uncomfortable. Really? So this is, this is quite recent. So you have been going through this quite recently. Let's get into that. How did you, what made you change your opinion? Yes. Okay. <laughs> oh boy, let's get into the spice. Um, so, my first stepping stone was so I've been fascinated with cults and cult psychology and cult abuse from a very early age. And I think it comes from trying to understand like my own process of indoctrination. And so I started reading um, this book called Combating Cult Mind Control by Stephen Hassan spelled Hassan for the listening audience. Um, and it's not purely about cult mind control. It's really about destructive influence and undue influence. And so reading this book really helped me. Um, it was the first time that someone had presented a full model for how this happens to people. And because Every time I was studying cults, I didn't understand how does this happen to people? How do people allow this to happen to themselves? And this is the first time I was presented with um, a model that really explained it all to me. And one thing that the author talks about in this book is that um, when you have certain absolutist, dogmatic, totalistic ideologies, there are, like I said before, thought terminating cliches. So this comes in the form of loaded language, meaning language that means something very specific to people who are in the in-group, insider doctrine versus outsider doctrine. And I was still stuck inside this world of absolutist thought. Even so I but I had these tools now. I had these I had a way to identify and put a finger on it and say, I know what's happening here. Hmm. I know what you're doing right here. You're using this form of influence. You're using this form of control. Wow. And so I started I you guys need to read this book. It's absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. Um and Well I mean um, what I really love what was that quote again about the uh the Anything the legitimate will stand under scrutiny. What, yeah, anything legit. Yeah, that was one too, but what was the cliche that you mentioned? The so, um, Robert J. Lifton, he was a Navy psychiatrist and he studied people who came out of communist re-education camps in the 50s. And so one mm -hmm. thing that he talks about as a way that critical thinking is shut down is you are loaded with 
what he calls thought terminating cliches, which is basically like preloaded um, things that uh, dogmas that are preloaded with meaning. Um, so it could be something as simple as um, dismissing uh, someone on the basis of their presumed privilege. It could be, yeah, um, I think of simple ones like all cops are bastards. Right. All cops are bastards. No, no critical thought. Boom. Shut it down. Um, and, um, or uh, cut a liberal and a fascist bleeds. Um, you know, it, they don't allow you to move forward in the critical thought. And so, I had these tools for suddenly identifying what was going on and how it started was in around January, um, actually because of Christmas, Christmas is kind of a really triggering time for me. Um, it really makes me realize how it makes me very uncomfortable in a lot of ways. Um, and I didn't, I was so uncomfortable when I was visiting home. And so I was starting, I was looking up like atheist content to just try to like, understand certain arguments and just kind of get it like a difference of opinion and um not feel so like religiously dogma out of my mind and um i got into like a lot of debates and another key thing that's talked about in this book is stephen hassan who is a survivor of cult abuse um he talks about how you can learn the most about a group by listening and deliberately seeking out its ex-members. Hmm. Um, which is very important, and it's something I really apply nowadays. He's like, it doesn't matter if it's going to adopt dogs at a puppy pound, right? <laughs> like, you should seek out, deliberately seek out an ex-member before you join a group. And so I was, like, looking up different content, and I started looking up, like, X blank versus blank apologist. Huh. Um, fill in any religion. Right, right. And, and so I was like, but I started to become very frustrated that a lot of the content was strictly like ex Christian focused. Right, right. Um, and I, I, coming from an identity politics mindset, um, I'm like, oh, that's, that's the dominant. That's the dominant group. I need to seek out these minorities. I need to. Right. I need to be in solidarity with these minorities. So I need to go seek them out. And so I just started like ex-Muslim versus Muslim apologists, like blah blah blah. Wow. And one of the first videos I found, <laughs> one of the first videos I found was um, apostate prophet and Armin. Uh, it was two ex-Muslims <laughs> discuss Christianity, and. Um, that video, I was not prepared. <laughs> like, <laughs> if I thought that ex Christians had some spicy opinions, like I was not prepared <laughs> for the spice level of the ex Muslim community. <laughs> like, you guys are on a 10 out of 10, like most of the time. <laughs> and, um, also, that particular conversation was very interesting because I had never heard a Muslim perspective on Christianity before, or mm. ex-Muslim perspective. And that blew my mind. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and so that led me down the path. And um, yeah, I typed up a little thing that was like kind of a walkthrough of my thinking. So I said, ironically, it was identity politics that led me to seek out these voices. Here's a, here's a preview into that line of Christi, a, a line of thinking. As Christianity is the world's largest religion, around 30 to 31 percent, and I am an ex-Catholic slash Christian, I am therefore of the majority, and my group dominates a lot of the spotlight in the West, you know, following this line of thinking. Therefore, it is my duty to be in solidarity with people not of the dominant group. Among them, um, you know, there's others, are the ex-Muslim community. So I sought out what they had to say. And then when I discovered what they had to say, it greatly contradicted, like, most of what I've been taught to believe about multiculturalism, intersectionality, identity politics, etc. I, I, what? Can you give you, us some examples? Yeah, yeah go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god, you guys have no idea. These kufar made my whole world implode in three months. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Oh. Tell us more about like what, but give us examples of some of the things that uh, you heard and that you found interesting or shocked. I'm glad I managed to get a good laugh out of you too. That was one of my goals for today. That's um, what it's all about. <laughs> so the most potent things would be three things. Bigotry of low expectations, the problem of the minority within the minority, mm. and third, the failures of cultural relativism. Wow. I was just repeatedly confronted it was it was like when I, for me, the ex-Muslim perspective was a perfect encapsulation of all of the failures or criticisms or little doubts that I had in my mind, but I was not allowed to express them because I come from a dominant group, therefore I automatically am discredited. Like, I can, I, I you, it's almost like you're taught to disbelieve your own intuitions because of the privileges that you're told that you have like the fact that i would doubt these ideologies they would probably say is because i'm still holding tight to these oppressions that i benefit from right so but if i'm following this way of thinking you guys are allowed to talk about it right yeah and i was like holy shit <laughs> um yeah what um all, all of these little failures, like devaluation of free speech alongside of deplatforming, mm. a, a toxic offense junkie culture, contradictions of identity politics, policing of ideology, hypocritical feminism, um, and the... Mm, there are inconsistencies within um, inclusivity and multiculturalism itself. And... Yeah, I was well, just you, you. You're giving us credit, but you explain you're you're doing a much better job at explaining these things than we do. You should like if you if you start a YouTube channel or a podcast, I would be hooked up. Like that's what I was saying. What? Yeah, I was, yeah, do that or write a book or something because this is amazing. You yeah, are, you're very I good was, at I, talking about these things. Like much better than I was. I, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I, I was saying that as soon as I read the outline, the first first thing I told her like it was like you know you need to write a book or start up a YouTube thing. So many people would learn so much from this, especially since, you know, you're not one of those, there's a lot of binary people. This, you know, one person's saying, okay, well, like the, the, the guy who just commented and was like, well, if you're not, if you don't like Antifa, then you're a neo-Nazi. If you're not a neo-Nazi, you're Antifa. Like that, the, there's so much basic crap out there. That, that itself uh, is a function of thought reform. Black right. and white thinking is a function of thought reform. Of thought reform, yeah. And, you know, I, I want to point out for everybody that uh, we actually had, and I don't know if you've heard this. Can you read it? Because it's oh, a mirror image. Robert I Tate. don't know if people can read it. Can read the oh, title. okay. So this is another book I'm reading right now. It's by Dr. Robert J. Lifton. It's titled Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, A Study of Brainwashing in China. This was published in the 50s or 60s, and this is – basically the seminal text on the process that we call brainwashing. Um, it describes in detail, he, he breaks down eight criteria of thought reform. And um, you don't have to be in a regime, you don't have to be in a re-education setting to notice these criteria. Um, yeah, it's mm. pretty prevalent actually. Yeah. This is. I, I wanted to point out that just, uh, uh, especially for you, if you haven't heard it, episode one hundred twelve that we did was with Leon Korteveg, uh, who is uh, from the Netherlands, and he used to be uh, a far right nationalist. He used to be a, a member oh, of. Oh, uh, yes, I have. Yeah. So he he used to be a, a member of a. Um, he even joined a, a neo Nazi group for a little while as well, uh, and now he's completely left all of that right and mm -hmm. he talked about the, this and he's also very this is a very very bright very articulate intelligent guy you know, like you um and he explained a lot of the same things that you're explaining as well just from his but but from his own personal experience so you said uh, so i mean the parallels of that are great so you you listen to a lot of our episodes then like because <laughs> you, well, yeah go ahead did you um it's 
Mm-hmm. At what point did you start listening to us and why? Um, uh, after I heard that first um, conversation between you and Ridvan, Ridwan um, Armin, I was like, oh, well, I need to, like, search for more of this. Like, it caught my attention. You're, I know that you guys are kind of controversial for your approach, but it was extremely emotionally salient for me. Like, it it hit and it worked. Um, and it, I don't know what I watched first or other episodes. Actually, no, I do. It was that I became a Patreon. You guys are the first Thing that I've ever been a patron to uh-huh. um, because I wanted to go watch the video version of the interview you guys did with Yasmin mm. and um, so that was a big one for me too because specifically her story of what she went through with the um, uh, the failure of her child abuse case yes. um, that is the most potent example of the failure of cultural relativism I have ever come across. It, it, it so perfectly reveals how insidious and um, disgusting this, uh, this, this cultural relativist impulse is. Um, and Again, when I found your guys' content, it was like a mirror was being held up Hmm. and saying, like, look, this is what you were really, this is the consequences of what you're really saying. Like, um, and it was, it was quite powerful to me. And it became so clear the more of your content, writings, etc., that you produce that, how consistent you guys are. Oh, wow. You guys are possibly the most consistent people or organization in terms of Atheist Republic that I've yet found. Well, Atheist um, Republic I mean, is granted, con- Secular Justice is consistent, but Atheist Republic isn't because it's supposed to be a republic, so well, we have contradictory okay. <laughs> views. <laughs> well, I, at least with your... Um, the the podcast that you guys do you oh. like you're stating your opinions, right, right, you're right. very consistent about your opinions, and you treat people across the board if you're going to hold a position generally i don't know your guys's whole history um, right. you hold it across the board for everyone and that's not the case inside these circles it bothered me greatly how more and more i was noticing that people were being explicitly treated differently on the basis of their identity and i thought that i was out of pocket for having these feelings because yeah. again, of my the sin of the group that I come from, I'm not allowed to have these doubts, or the doubts that I have are only a function of the dominant group that I come from, and I'm, you know, being reactionary or counter-revolutionary against these ideas that supposedly represent these oppressed minority groups, right? What are some of the views that you have right now? that your former self would find the most controversial and unacceptable? <laughs> and Good question. Yeah. Um, I probably wouldn't be having this conversation. Right. Um, I... Oh, you know what? So I've been studying absolutism very in detail. And I've come to the conclusion, at least so far, that there's only a single absolute that can stand under scrutiny. And that would be free speech absolutism. Hmm. And, um, I mean, maybe I'll find more absolutes that stand under scrutiny, but so far that's what I've come up with. And I would be diametrically opposed to that in the past. Um, I mean, mean, there are some examples that I don't know if it will... I don't don't think it's against free speech absolutism, but a lot of people think it does. Um, if it's if scams, I think like if if you say, "Hey, this 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 cures your cancer," and if it doesn't, and you're just lying to people, I think, and not, that should be a crime. And a lot of people think that's against free speech absolutism, yeah. but I don't think it is because that's already being covered under a different crime, 
right? You're not being well, exactly right. Yeah, okay. I'm in. I'm in the, on the same page. That, that's we, that. That's what goes violence, for. Violence, scam, right. deception. Right. We have additional laws that, at least in my country, where those are already off the table. Those are not protected speech. Right. So, so uh, I, I'm I'm pretty extreme with free speech. Like I think, like if some mm-hmm. if people say that Armin should be killed. Mm-hmm. I think that should be legal for people to be able to say. But I think the mm-hmm. line that I draw that it should be illegal is if they say, go kill Armin, that's, yeah, the, th- that's illegal. Yeah. But if, I, if people say, it would be great if somebody kills Armin, and that would be fantastic, and I think it would, you know, people who kill Armin are doing a good job, I think all of that should be allowed. But I don't know. Maybe I'm too extreme. But do you agree? Yeah, I think so. Okay, okay. Good. The only thing that I'm still trying to figure out um, how this all fits into free speech absolutism specifically is the spread of misinformation. Hmm. Um, that's... I'm still trying to figure out where that fits in. Um, yeah. So let's see how extreme you are for your former <sighs> self. Would you today <laughs> agree that... Um, the uh, anti-white racism is a is a huge problem right now in the West. What do you mean by huge? Well, systemic. Systemic. Yes. Certainly not systemic. Um, I think it's systemic. I think it's the only form of racism right now in the West that is systemic. We sort of disagree on this, Armin and I. Yeah, so I whatever answer you choose, you're you're on the right side. You're, <laughs> no, I mean no I'm not like you. I'm not gonna you know kowtow my opinion to yours. Um, Thank you. You passed the test. There you go. <laughs> okay, go on. As, as um, if we're supposed to test everybody. I'm gonna anyway. Yeah. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say that it is a problem that is rising that people do not want to admit and the data shows yes. that like i've been explicitly looking up federal hate crime data mm-hmm. and yes it is not on the same level as against other groups but it is happening and it is rising um well the the level of it and whether it's no systemic or not is two different things right so it could be less in the level of hate crimes but if it's more accepted to be anti-white and not seen as a problem and tolerated more, then that's that's a sign for me that it's systemic. Even if the that's hate- what you mean by systemic. Mm-hmm. By systemic, I thought you meant codified in law. Oh no, codified in society, not in law. I ooh, that's tricky. It's I think it's highly regional. Hmm. Um, so where I live, that's completely acceptable, if not promoted and expected. Um, if I say right now on this podcast that, man, white no. people are the prob- are the behind most of the problem in the world, right? Some people mm-hmm. will shake their head and be like, Armin, what the hell? That's so stupid. And we'll, they will move on, right? But if I say, I think most of the problems in the world right now is because of the Jews or because of black people, that's going to get, that's not just going to go away with like, Armin, you're dumb. What the hell? What kind of opinion is that? That's going to get this podcast shut down. That's going to get a lot of people like extremely angry. The reaction to that would be astronomically higher. Um mm-hmm. So how is that not a sign that anti-white res- white racism is more it's systemic? Like, and not, yeah, maybe not in law, not yet at least, but at least in, so- in society, it's more like something that is just accepted. We're just like, yeah. I mean, even among people who don't, don't agree with it, it's more tolerated. Okay, and that if, if we're talking about it that way, I would agree. Okay. Um, wow, so you... Do you... Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree with that too. But systemic generally means. Don't that forget your questions. I, I was looking at the same. Des- uh, no, mm-hmm. the, 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 s- systemic generally means that it is an official part of the system. Like it's, right. it, it, like it is in the system, in in laws and legislation. Well, there's and, more and systems than just a law system. So I know. Yeah. 
Yeah, but, but Susanna, I mean, you the, were gonna when you say systemic, right? Susanna, you were gonna say you said do you? You were gonna ask a question. What's that? Oh question? yeah. Okay. Have you guys heard of something called the grievances studies hoax? No. Um, you guys need to look into this. So basically, in 2018, three scholars, Peter Bogosian, James Lindsay, and oh, Helen yeah. Rose, okay, did yeah. a series of deliberately ludicrous academic scholarly papers to basically show that people in these critical studies fields, meaning fill in the blank, critical gender, critical race, critical whiteness studies, critical disability studies, etc. Um, do not, they, they use poor methodology. And so they made these deliberately ludicrous and insane papers to demonstrate that these journals have a severe bias that they're working on. And part of that included papers where they basically Wait, started what, with Was these... one of this Peter Bogos? Like his... mm -hmm. Okay, okay, yeah, I heard about that too as well. Yeah, that's his thing. It's the same the one. The guy with Peter the last and, name uh, that I can never pronounce. Alan Pluckrose and... Yep. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, Bogosian, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So part of that entailed well two papers that really caught my attention and if you guys want access to the actual papers they wrote i found their google drive where they made them available to the public but um i just watched one clips of, the of them explaining it but go on. Yeah. yeah no no i saw the papers i i, I read the paper they were hilarious right it was absolutely but you know there was a it was a socal like a, a, the socal hoax yeah yeah. The Sokol hoax of the 90s. They used a Hitler, a got... they used like Mein Kampf and they just changed it to... Um... Intersectional feminism. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's genius. Okay, okay. They put chapter 12 of Mein Kampf, which I believe entails defining the goals of the Nazi party and what's expected of its members. Mm. They took it, they just did, you know, a text replacement inserting the language of intersectional feminism mm, yeah. and then you know they changed the language so that it went you know flag plagiarism and they then you know inserted other scholarly works to make it an academic paper and it was accepted mm. and it didn't end up getting published because they were discovered before it could actually go to publication but when I learned that, I wanted to throw my entire gender studies and sexualities minor that I got in college in the fucking garbage. Um, <laughs> it, yeah. And it was so scary to me because I had been taught the exact things that they were talking about. And I took it on and I believed it. And um, another paper is demon another to touch on what you're talking about before in terms of how systemic this is, one of the other papers that they... Um, had was basically talking about how as a f male, white male college age students should be literally chained to the floors to experience what that would have been like to been enslaved, to like completely wow. invert the dominance hierarchy of oppression. Mm -hmm. And and go as so far as when the reviewers sent the paper back to them they were like yeah well this is good but the the, but the men shouldn't be comforted like when they're when this is going on they shouldn't be comforted from this experience <laughs> like they just need to sit in it <laughs> and um they there was this other paper that they nicknamed dog park where they basically started as writers, they started with the conclusion that we should train men like we train dogs, literally with leashes. They started with that conclusion. They wrote the paper backwards. Wow. And it not only was it accepted, it was published and it received an award from the journal. What? Okay. <laughs> as an important contribution to knowledge. Jesus. Okay. So that definitely is some evidence that this is systemic because mm. it was these journal, these peer reviewers didn't see a problem. Mm. What they talk about when they um, talk about this hoax that they pulled off, um, time after time again, every time the reviewers sent them back comments, they wanted it to be crazier. Mm. Um, and I started to notice in these circles, what really started to draw me away 
um, was I I joined and I became involved because I was looking for non judgment. I had felt so judged and so condemned by the Catholicism that I grew up in that I was running to anyone I thought would not do that to me. But the longer I was involved, the more I started to feel that these are the most judgmental people I've come across. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they're, well, it's very yeah, similar it to Christianity. To no, but isn't it very similar to Christianity? Like the original sin of whiteness? Um, Have you the crimes um, of the ancestors, the crimes of the father being the crimes of the son. Like you're basically re responsible for the slavery that your ancestors, like it's basically Christianity, like Christianity 2.0. And there's no way that you could, uh, there's no way that you could get rid of the sin. The only way, the only thing you could do is just get on your knees and ask for forgiveness and you gain redemption. You have to accept your sinfulness and there's no other way out. This is, it seemed like they just copied Christianity. Isn't well, it? except, Armin, there's very important differences. The one thing that I will give Christianity, and this is what Peter Bogosian says, is that in Christianity there's a redemption narrative. Christianity has salvation. There is no salvation in if, if you take on this identity politic approach. Because if you try to um, show your repentance through your actions, it's performative allyship. You're only being an ally. These are, yeah. I love these names, only, by the way. No, it's but, a, it's oh, a, that's you a, have no idea how, because again, it comes back to loaded language, loaded language. And this is why when you're talking to an SJW, they have their own language. They have their own double speak that it becomes, it's, it's highly technical and it's purposefully so because it, 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 it signals who is in the in group, who is in the out group. Right. But so, so here's the thing. Here's a book suggestion. If it's not already been done yet, you could write a dic dictionary, like a guide to woke, <laughs> like woke one like the woke dictionary I or something. I have a whole list that of, I've been compiling. <laughs> turn that into a book and come up with com you like, to, and joke, uh, met, you need to joke definitions of each one of them. I think that would be great. That that would be like un unique if somebody hasn't already done that. I don't know. What do you think? I will buy that. I mean, I don't know if anyone has already done this. It's oh, I don't know. Um, Self-publish it if you do that. By the way, you don't. When you start yeah, to but get I, this, people automatically assume you're alt right, um, which is not a. It shouldn't be a, a dissuader to me. But wait, I want to quickly point out that you guys should. This is a printout, but you should read. It's it was it's written by one of the people who. Um, did the grievance studies hoax his name is james a Lindsay, and he wrote yeah. something with um mike mena on ariel meg called postmodern religion in the faith of social justice and so a lot of what i'm talking about is drawing upon his work as he shows because he wrote a whole book about religious psychology um how social justice he posits is um Critical social justice, I should say, you know, through this lens, um, is structured very similarly as a close cousin to religion. And he argues hmm. for a, a new form of secularism from this ideology. And, um, yeah, he taught, touches on a lot of stuff. Um, privilege as original sin. Um, there's themes of a priest caste in terms of, like institutionalization of certain diversity policies uh it's really really interesting do you think they actually mm. copied ideas or they just happen to be the same because they work say that one more time so do you think that these ideas were copied from religion or they just by chance happen to be the same because they work and it's just a survival of the fittest meme I think it is because um, the, whether or not you believe in God, there are certain psychosocial needs that need to be met. Right, right. So and like so this movement fills those psychosocial needs. Exactly. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I think that you know, this is that's ex exactly what I was thinking is that there is a the common denominator with all of these, whether it's Christianity or with any kind of cult that you get into, 
whether it's the Antifa thing, whether it's a neo-Nazi thing, whether it's Islam, whether all of these things, they all, I, they're, they're, the common denominators are that sense of meaning, that sense of identity. I think the, uh, this thing that you talked about, the, uh, the thought-terminating cliches, they all have their sense of thought terminating cliches. 100%. Like there's so many of them in Islam, like that just that you know, they say <gasps> Wait, these things just to, to shut something. down critical thought. Go yeah. On. So this freaked me out. It it shook me to my core. So um Armin, I don't know if you remember, you put out a video recently titled Iranian Propaganda colon, the blood of Qasem Soleimani will be avenged. And it's when you review that Shia propagandist, you, you're, you like, breaking down that video that he did. Um, and um, this Shia propagandist was saying phrases and attitudes that I had heard expressed in the people around me. There you go. Okay. And when... I was like, if I'm around, if I'm surrounded, if, if if what I'm around sounds like a Shia propagandist, I need to be very concerned. I even wrote down some of the quotes from the what the guy says in the video that caught my attention. Um, Disassociate disassociate yourself entirely away from the enemy, America. Cut your heart away from the enemy. If you are living in America, think of leaving. Now would be the time. Boycott America. Do not invest in America. It is a terrorist regime. And then he goes on. Muslims, Christians, and Jews should take a careful look at what America wants from them and then do the opposite. If you if it wants you to fight amongst yourselves, be peaceful and unite. If you want if it wants you to shut up, take this bribe, be peaceful, get up and fight. Um and then he goes on. Be a proud comrade of this revolution, a comrade of the resistance wherever you are. America are the most well-funded terrorists in the world. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, it, that was a huge wake-up call for me. Like, I was not expecting to hear those same things coming from this source. Hmm. Uh, this is why a lot of these isn't that why a lot of these leftist group respect it's very interesting because both the far left mm -hmm. and the far right find things in Islam that they respect. <clears throat> the far left finds like I've, I follow a lot of far left content. Um, by the way, a lot of people m messaged us like, why do you think far left? You're talking about this is not an economic. Yeah, not economic or far, f economic far left. We're talking about the woke cult, whatever you want to call it. OK, but both the con both the woke cult that I follow, they found things in Islam that they respect. And also alt right, like f far right groups openly, openly admit that there are fine things in Islam that they ad uh, that they res respect. They they the tribalism, the value mm -hmm. for family, the place of women in society, uh, their views on the Jews, uh, their, um, gay people. their their sense on homo uh, homosexuality, and the, the right-wing people say, you know, this is Islam is an enemy that we respect and we have to copy because they say that, they say that openly, it's like they're our enemy, but they're winning because they have managed to convince the p their people to follow the right strategy. We're losing mm. because we haven't convinced people to follow the strategies that make a society win. Yeah. That's we what they well, I think they're would. jealous that they do not have a explicit, direct claim to the word of God. Th that's so the they thing. That it, to you in totality. Yeah, that helps. Yeah, we, they had, don't have Gra <laughs> we had Graham Wood on the, on the show. Uh, Graham that was Wood, a great episode. Yeah, for the Atlantic, and and he actually talked about how he went to school with Richard Spencer. Yeah. And when he when he talked to him and he asked him about, and Richard Spencer was like, he was thinking of, he's like, well, look at ISIS; they give the sense of belonging. Everybody wants to join them. We got to be like that too. It was amazing, and that that's the thing. That's a common denominator. I mean, they don't have to copy Christianity. This this kind of stuff just it's a natural common de denominator for this kind of cult thinking and and to brainwash people. So did you? Wow. Did what, what a. Well, sorry. Sorry. Did you get a sense of belonging in the in the leftist cult? For a time, um, it's tough because I mean maybe this is my own per internal projection, 
Mm. Um, but because I'm white, there was always suspicion. Mm. Um, <laughs> so racist. Um, or I have to go above and beyond to prove myself. Mm. How is that not racism? How do they not see that that's racism? I never get that. Because I'm the racist, Armin. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> in inherently racist. Yeah, and no, there's this... nothing I can do to undo it. Mm. I will always be. And, like, it's, it, there's no winning. There's no winning. There's no redemption. There's no salvation. Right. There's no one who can absolve my sins. That's I will exactly always, the point. I will, I will always benefit and profit from these believed dominant hierarchies of oppression yeah the, the very idea that you can be canceled forever and there's nothing you can do to redeem oh yourself, i hate the cancel culture that like, was a big that's problem. actually that's very that is actually uh, that makes christian christianity actually look, look um nicer look more benevolent it's really bizarre what are some <laughs> of what are some of the questions that you you were hoping that we ask you but we haven't asked you so far um oh that's tough um wait let me look at my notes I, actually i can think of a million more things i want to ask no, but you I wanna know what, what let's Susanna, talk about it what are the things that Susanna was looking forward to it oh like... okay so yeah, go ahead. like i was saying i had started to have my own doubts and my own internal criticism of certain tactics but like i said i am, was inherently going to invalidate my own um questions that I had, right? And so there's this um, sense in leftist circles of this principle of organize your own, meaning like um, the community that you come from is basically the only community that you are entitled to go organize around because if you try to organize with like, say, um, a group for black rights or something, like I would be imposing my narrative on them and assuming that I know what's best for, etc. So I was like, okay, well, if I can't work or if I can't organize other communities, like I need to go organize my own community. And one thing that's constantly said is like, you need to go get white people's shit together. <laughs> like you need to go get them together. And right. so I started thinking about it and I was like, okay, and I studied psychology in school. I want to become a psychologist. And um, I became very concerned, like I said before, what led me into this was about far right nationalism, extremism, um, race based violence, etc. And so I was like, okay, like I need to go figure out, um, you know, how to go help these people. And so I started studying how people leave Nazi groups and stuff. And as you guys are well aware, there's this attitude of like, go punch a Nazi. Mm. Like that's how you prove that you're really down for it. You need to go punch Nazis. And the more I studied, I was like, it doesn't work. Mm. That's not how people leave these <laughs> groups. Punching Nazis doesn't work. If you go study former Nazis, former white supremacists, Aryan brotherhoods, etc. The thing that always deconverts people out of pretty much any extremist group is they continue to have experiences that disprove and go against their deeply held assumptions. Right. What gets people out of these groups is having their dogma repeatedly refuted based on personal experience with the people that they least expect compassion from. Hmm. And it, it, I became, I started to become so frustrated because I'm like, guys, these tactics aren't going to work. Right. They're just not going to work. In fact, they are going to fuel persecutory complexes that are inherent to absolutist dogma. Right. And there, I started to notice um, a, a great bent towards what in social psychology is called infrahumanization, which is basically the stepping stone to dehumanization. It's this tacitly held belief that your in-group is more human than the out-group. It's, it's the denial of uniquely human emotions to the out-group, hmm. which in tacitly implies that they are less human. Um, 
And the less that you ascribe the complexity of human emotions to your enemy, the less likely you are to help them. And mm -hmm. these attitudes started to become more and more... Um, it, they started to apply to more and more people. It's not just Nazis. And I mean, you're very quick to jump and call anyone a fascist if you are not on the left pole like they are. And it, I mean, um, it could be it could be cops, the way that people talk about cops. It could be the way that people talk about um, people in government. It could be. Um, People, it could be Trump supporters, it could be a, an everyday conservative, it could be... Or just actual Nazis uh, too, yeah. like we, like a lot of people think like, oh, yeah, okay. most people are not act well, self-identifying Nazis, because a lot of people are like, oh, there's mm -hmm. no Nazi party anymore. I'm talking about self-identifying Nazis. A lot of people are like, oh, no, these people are not Nazis, let's not be nice to them. I like... Well, actually, let's also be nice to the actual Nazis as well, right? Like, and people think like, oh, my God, Armin, uh, you've gone too far. But I do that with Muslims, too. Like, a lot pe not Muslims, because a lot of people are like, oh, wow. Yeah, we need to be nice to Muslims. They're not all terrorists. And I'm like, well, we actually have to be nice to the terrorists as well. Like, not just the, um, your average Muslim, because how are you going to de-radicalize ISIS mm -hmm. members, right? Like... Like even ISIS members, I think like you need to talk, sit down and talk to them like your fellow human beings. Not you know, and when people say like, "Oh, be nice to them because they're not terrorists," I think you're missing the point. No, be nice to also the terrorists. I don't know unless they're in, unless you're in battle and they're shooting at you. Of course, not, I'm not talking about yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, literal this... self defense. Right. Yeah, that's a conversation. I mean, we had that with Aaron as well. That you know, when you're going out and you're talking about your ideas and your opinions, you can say whatever you want to, and of course it's going to piss off people. No change has happened without that ever in history. But when you're talking one-on-one -on -one to people as human beings, we're all actually very different because we treat that person to the context of their experience, what they've been through. Um, if they're very aggressive towards you, maybe because they're a victim themselves. You, you don't know what somebody's personal story is. You approach it differently. Um, By the way, Ali, so I have... was going to say this off air, but I'm going to have to tell this to Ali right now because I feel bad. I feel like I was kind of mean to Ali, extra mean to Ali today. I kind of dismissed a lot of his questions. What? I was like, no, was... no, you weren't. Right. You're, okay, you're, 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 I... you're just as mean to me as you always are. I don't no, think I think I was a little bit too, a little bit like dismissing your questions. No, a little bit too you weren't. <laughs> okay. You were usually at a... You're usually at a 9.5 out of 10, and you still were today. Okay, good. I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I mean, it doesn't matter. I was uh, bugging this him is too, not. So. This is not nearly as extreme as I've seen. <laughs> I think you know. You know when you were 14 and you realized that your best friend was more than just your best friend. I feel like that's kind of happening with me and Armin right I now. I think a lot of people think like me and Ali don't get along. The passion but, cannot be denied. <laughs> yeah, but Ali, just to make it clear to our audience right now, because a lot of people get this misconception. Ali is my best friend, okay? Like, I hope people realize that. Like, oh, we're, he seems like we're mean to each other, but he is my best friend. But go on, Ali. Sorry. If I wasn't, if I wasn't a male, a cis male born in the 70s, then I would probably feel like crying right now. <laughs> but unfortunately... I don't. I wasn't socialized that way. The only feelings I All have right. are What's your gassy, question? hungry. You were good, you were oh, okay. <laughs> Those are my emotions. Hey, um, so no, no. I was gonna say that I, I could. I, I feel like we need to continue this conversation, but we're running out of time. So we have about seventeen minutes. Can we talk again? Yes, through. please. Yeah, yeah. Can we, we will. have you back we're on? We're gonna do that. Yeah, literally whenever you want. I'm 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 on shelter in place. I got all, nothing better to do. We're all isolated. <laughs> we can totally do this whenever. This is the most socializing I've had in like two or three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> this has been like re I am going to go and read this uh, thing. I, I I've learned so I've actually learned a hell of a lot today. So yes. I, and I've been looking because I want to read things. So, uh, oh shit, what was that thing I think that you for said? For me, it comes from the lens that I understand things best is psychology. Um, some people yeah. understand things on the macro geopolitical level. My lens that I understand the best is the micro interpersonal psychosocial level. And I mean, I'm very passionate about psychology. And it's actually my goal to go to grad school to become a psychologist. And I want to have a focus on providing empirical evidence for using critical thinking as a de-radicalization tool. Wow. Yeah, I, you know what, I, I and I it's think- It's a field that needs a lot more empirical support. 
I think you would be fantastic at it because I think you've got both the, you've you've got the uh, uh, not just like the intellectual part of it and the articulation part of it and the insight part of it down. So the honesty. Um, you've also got the knowledge and you've done the research and you continue to do it. And on top of that, you also have the personal lived experience. And so you know honest, you have that the empathetic. Honesty, the, yeah, the honesty, uh, especially with yourself. I mean, the hardest thing for, to be. Is, is for people to be honest with themselves about it, but I think that you're unrelentingly honest with yourself. So I think that oh I, I think it'd be fantastic. Um, and I am going to, yeah, I've got to read this uh, thought hey. reform in the psychology of totalism, Robert J. Lifton. Like I'm absolutely obsessed with it, and I want to reach out to Steve Hassan and get him on the podcast too. You guys cause... either need to have him on the podcast or be interviewed for his work on the Freedom of Mind Resource Center. It's a YouTube channel. You can watch amazing content that he has. I would suggest watching his interviews that he's done. Armin, you can help me on the pronunciation. His name is Masood Bani Sadar. Um, Bani Sadar? Thank you. Maybe. Um, I, don't know. I have to see it he, in writing. <laughs> he was a member of MEK for 20 years. Ooh. And he wrote a book and... He talks about how he was de-radicalized, how he was radicalized, how he abandoned his family for MEK. He was a he was a representative for the United Nations representing MEK. Wow, um, Ali, invite invite him. And yeah, um, the, wait, this is Steve Hassan, or st what's the other? Guy they have name? interviews with each other. They're friends. Invite them okay. both. Um, and nowadays they are both involved with something called the open minds foundation hmm. which is um a foundation that is aimed at educating the public about destructive and undue influence promoting critical thinking um and it's um the majority of people who are involved are people who escaped high control or destruct destructive groups um like stephen has um stephen hassan he was a member of have you you guys know what the Moonies are? No. Um. Oh boy. Oh boy. So um, that's the <laughs> nickname for it. Um. But the full, the more well known name is the official name is the Unification Church, and it was um, a far right church that believed that a Korean man named Sun Young Moon was the Messiah come back to return to Earth. Um. It was. I mean, I could go into so much. It was actually originally created by the in conjunction with the Korean CIA because yeah. the CIA saw that the Chinese had their thought reform and their brainwashing, so their idea was, oh, we need our own. Um, mm. <laughs> it, it goes very deep, but um, Stephen yeah. Hassan is an amazing person. You should look into Falun Dafa as well. I think that would be fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. By the way, the I, I also we also had an episode here with uh, Ron Miscavige, yes. who is yes. uh, the 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 father of uh, mm -hmm. David Miscavige, who's the head of the Scientology Church right now. And then he he actually got his whole family into Scientology. He literally and then he left. escaped. <laughs> yeah, and he left it. That was a really wild interview as well. And and you'll you'll like it a lot because Yasmin was one of our co-hosts at the time. By the way, the, first the year, MEK so. is what is this? I think by far the scariest cult I know. Like the most terrifying. I think yeah. You 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 guys often say I mean um that like Islam is the most dangerous religion on the planet and I think I would agree in terms of numbers but I think possibly the most the scariest religion in the planet is a group that has now has very few members but it was called Om Shinrikyo. It was in Japan mm. and they um orchestrated and did a sarin gas attack on the subways of Tokyo. Hmm. Um, oh, I remember they, this. They were very close to be having nuclear weapons. Mm. Um, Om Shinrikyo is one of the scariest cults out there. They literally believe in like destroying the world to save it. Um, well, scary and most dangerous are different because for you to be the most dangerous, you have to actually be successful. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. and that's what I would say would <laughs> right. be the main delineating factor. Yeah. But the MEK okay, is a so marriage between communism and Islam. Think about like think about what you get when you mix communism and Islam. That's one ugly baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so guys, we're gonna go on to patron, patron questions. Patron questions. We've yes. got ten minutes, so I'm sorry, we're probably not gonna get to no. All try of to them. read all of them. Read all of them. It's okay. I I will Perfect. try to read all of them. Robert Hamilton saying hello. Well, first of all, first comment. Is from Aaron 
Aaron, who uh, oh. was uh, okay. on the thing last night, and uh, sorry, last time, mm-hmm. and she was saying, "Shit, did I just lose it?" Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's saying hi, guys, and then she's saying, "You look beautiful, Susanna." And I think oh, that's because, thank you. You know, I had to return the compliment. <laughs> yeah, because you said that to her last time, and I think that this is just. Yeah. It's, it's just, I wanted again, to say that, but I can't because I, my how gender. You guys are just judging each other on looks. It's it should be uh, a crime. No, they're, to say they're that the same to a gender, woman. so they can say it. I wanted to say that, but I can't because I'm a man, and people wouldn't like. Oh, yeah, I- it's like I call all my guy friends <laughs> bitches all the time, but I never do. It's so sexist. I never call. It's a double standard I have with main men and women. All right, I only right, call the males. Just let it fly. Let it rip. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, let's see what happens then. Uh, okay, so uh, so- Sohan Sohan is sending an ex-Catholic fist bump. Sohan de Souza. So I know he, he's up in Boston. Solidarity, man. Yeah, yeah, Aaron Jones is saying solidarity, girl, bisexual tomboy here in a family that thinks it's a demonic possession. So very similar <laughs> kind of. Uh, not extreme, but are they still I'm Catholic? Um, my mom is still a very devout. Christian, she will. I mean, she said she's like, "Oh, I'm such a bad Catholic," but um, my dad basically, when my parents got divorced and my dad wanted to get remarried, he can't do that in the Catholic Church, so <laughs> he's not really big on that so much anymore. And I had a conversation with him when he visited me recently, and he basically, he's, I guess, kind of agnostic now. Um, um. Yeah. And they're but, okay yeah, with. Going are they okay? Question. Were they okay with you when you became an ex-Catholic? Were they Were they accepting? Uh, I mean, the, it was obviously like a long time coming. I was such a. <laughs> I was such a stick in the mud as an adolescent. Like they, it wasn't explicit. They knew what was up. Like because oh. I was, I would just not make going along with it easy for yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, and and did you try to make them feel guilty for being white when you went through that phase? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> it damaged my relationship with my family, 100%. Wow. Really? Um, when you see the people around you as embodiments of systems of oppression, it's very hard to get along. Hmm. And I think when you feel this type of way, you have a special resentment towards the older generations in your family because essentially they're responsible for not teaching you better, quote unquote, like Mm. they're responsible for your own internalized biases, like, or ways that they didn't make you woke or that they refused to be woke. Yeah. Et cetera. It, especially with my grandparents, um, it was not good, but I'm, doing a lot to rebuild that relationship with them right now. Nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I feel bad for you. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Mars is saying, uh, have you tried uh, talking uh, far or regressive leftists back to a liberal standpoint? How have they reacted to the hypocrisy and dogmatism in their stances? And were you able to teach, reach them? Have you had any success? Like, uh, I know it's been a short time, but... Yeah, so, I mean, this all really began for me in earnest, like, three months ago. And so, again, one thing that Hassan talks about in his book is you should separate yourself from anything that professes the ideology that you're bought into for, like, a minimum of two weeks. And so I did that. I shut, I, like, didn't talk to anyone, really. I didn't absorb any of that media. Basically, I stopped self-indoctrination. And, um... I just started, I deliberately started seeking out the most critical information I could find. And I think I've kind of extended that period a bit. Like I'm, I mean, it also like COVID shut down my opportunity to go to events and find these people and talk to them directly. But in general, I've been just studying really hard, thinking a lot because I when I feel ready and able to, I want to be able to present things the most consistently, the most factually as possible. And that means I have to make sure my foundation of knowledge is quite strong. So that's something I want to do. um, But I'm still like building up my tools. Like, um, 
Honestly, yeah, if you have I, this much to offer after such a short amount of time, I can't I just know. wait. I can't wait to see what you have to tell us like a year from now. Yeah, like, it's, it's been You're three months star. and you're coming with like so many studies and books and so you're so good at explaining. Yeah. Like honestly, you're going to be like, I, I, I hope you keep doing this because this is going to be so valuable to all of us. Yeah. So the, the answer of Mars to your question is just, uh, if you just wait, hopefully the next time Susanna's back on the show, then, you know, yes. uh, we're going to have people who just heard this episode and who knows what's going to happen. Like, think about, like, so, I can't, uh, like, honestly, like, think about this guy, like, on the live chat. This is all after we're hearing, we're learning so much from you. Like, when you're listening to the Secular Jihadist podcast, the things that you're learning from us is after, like, more than a decade of experience. But what we're getting from Susanna is what's after three months. Three months. So oh, that's really good. I mean, a big foundation for this is my degree in psychology. Right. So that I mean, that did take me like four years. But in terms of turning it onto this topic, yeah, <laughs> fairly short amount of time. Months, yeah, yeah, yeah a lot of people have degrees in psychology, but I've I've known a lot of them. But uh, th 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 this kind of insight is rare. Robert is asking, <laughs> what are uh, your impressions of the status of women within the atheist movement? Ooh. Or have you been involved in the atheist movement at all? Or uh, do you know anything about it, the status of women? I mean, I've been watching a lot of debates, different content. Um, I don't understand, like, why we need to bring intersectionality to atheism <laughs> um <laughs> it's it's a non-belief like right. um i mean i do understand in terms of like who we're showing who we're propping up who we're celebrating um i don't know in terms of like this whole women and the atheist movement thing it just it, it starts to remind me about like a lot of yeah, these previous ways of thinking, like, I'm gonna be honest, like, when I see drama go down in the atheist movement, I'm like, what the hell are you guys? <laughs> like, but, oh, tell me about it. Such drama. But for me, it it's the opposite, actually. I honestly, when I look at the drama in the atheist movement, I'm like, yeah, this is normal. Because yeah. a lot of people, a lot of atheists are like, oh, I thought we were supposed to be above this. And I'm always, when people say that, I'm like, why do you think I w we would be above this? There's nothing special about us other than the fact that we got the answer to one question right. So I've been involved <laughs> in so many other things and they all have drama. Any, any mm -hmm. movement when it grows, it's going to have drama. And I, I don't understand why people think like it's not going to happen with our movement. Of course there's going to be okay, drama. Okay, I guess what I mean is often it becomes these interpersonal battles. Um. Yeah. And about like who has the most reputation, sway. That's ex that's I don't human like nature. That. That's yeah, I know. I mean, I, I don't. Know. Like it. <laughs> I don't like it. I don't like it either. But it would it surprises me that it surprises people that we have it. I'm not it saying it's surprise me. Yeah, it doesn't surprise you, but I'm, it does surprise a lot of our people. Like, oh, I thought atheists are supposed to be this and that. Like, like when when people say I thought atheists were supposed to be smart. I'm always tempted to respond, and I don't usually say that, but I always tell, tempted to respond, well, like, then you're an example for why that's not true. <laughs> like, because <laughs> why would you make that assumption? <laughs> but, uh, I got to, you know, I got to say, when, when people talk about, and, and we've talked about this a lot, that I get, uh, email, I, I get messages from people saying that, why are you associating with Armin? He's a neo-Nazi apologist <laughs> and all this shit. And then he gets messages talking about how I am this sort of softy, hyper left, like regressive. And like, why do you get along? I'll tell you one of the reasons that, that we do get along is because we don't care about who hates us. Like I have loads that of people who I've heard. Obvious. <laughs> we, I've heard from loads of people who say, oh, I don't want to work with him. He's just, you're a piece of shit. You're the, I don't want to work with you. And it's same with Armin, but Armin, there are people who have hated us, who have launched tirades against us and then you know when we had to work for what we believe in we just went in we've met them in person and it's fine and it sometimes it, it shocks people i've seen people like oh really you don't hate me and it, it because it's not I, I don't really care about uh and armin does it either about you know our personal because we're both idiots like both of us i don't 
it, you take yourself, you take your work seriously, but if you take, once you start taking yourself seriously, that's when it's the end. It's over. I so. mean, I will have to say, to be fair, you know, with the whole anything legitimate will stand under scrutiny. Before this, I went out of my way to dig up dirt on you guys. Oh. You yeah. Oh, <laughs> tell us. Yeah. Wait, wait. I want to hear this. I have to scrutinize these guys. <laughs> So what did, did you? Did you? Okay. Oh, really? I want to know. Yeah, yeah. We should have done a whole. That's we got to do a whole episode on this. But uh, give us a headline. No, tell us. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah like, tell us. I'm like one of those people where when I get impassioned, I become like psycho cyber stalker. Well, stalker is a strong word, but you know what I mean, like investigator. Right. Um, I dig deep, and well, basically, yeah. I was looking for criticism from for, about you guys obviously not from the religiously offended um and um there wasn't really much that's that there's not that much dirt on you guys um really or legitimate criticism in my opinion um for ali i think people are mainly like oh he has trump derangement syndrome like he they does. Think you- <laughs> it, it is. I, I, I haven't been... Listen, some no, diseases okay, okay, are better I, 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 I know, I know. You already just went to this. It's Susanna. better than pancreatic cancer. What, I mean, what would you rather have? Oh sex my addiction God. and Trump derangement syndrome or, like, liver cancer? All right, yeah. so we'll go on. So then. Alcoholism. <laughs> alcoholism oh is another God. great disease. Some diseases are better than others. Uh, okay, the joke is over now. So then um, continue. <laughs> yeah, so basically thing Ali, like, doesn't apply... I don't know. They think Critical that you thinking. are a little bit like maybe out of pocket in the way that you uh, maybe um, exaggerate the problem of conservative things. Yeah. Um, and then for Armin, um, I mean, there's of course like people generally think his approach <laughs> is too spicy, um, <laughs> and too too fuego. They can't <laughs> handle the heat, man. Um, which is fine. But, I mean, it works for me. Um, and I think, you know, interestingly, the most well thought out criticism of you guys that I was able to find is actually from one of our patrons, um, Jaren Jove. Okay. You know, his whole blog. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. goes. Um, <laughs> oh, we should have him on, by the way. Yeah. And yeah, um, let's do that. I'll we'll note that down. His beef seems to be. Um, I mean, I'm not going to represent his opinion. Let me back up. My, the impression that I got was he's frustrated with how ex-Muslims um, dismiss hin- self-identified Hindu atheists. Right. Um, and, yeah, it just seems to have a lot of frustrations about the Western ex-Muslim movement in general. But he had the most well-thought-out, like... Did you watch my discussion re- with him on Atheist Republic? I watched about two thirds of it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Wait. Really? That's the worst thing. On, on that's the worst thing. Like nothing. Like there. What is? Okay. Here's a question. What is something I mean, that I you disagree with? Not not, <laughs> not dirt, but what is a disagreement? What is a disagreement that you have with Ali, and what is a disagreement that you have with me? If you think of it. Oh man. Oh. No. No pressure. Uh, I might have to get back to you on that. I can't. Okay. That hasn't been my primary focus lately. Um, I think that on Atheist Republic on the live show, like there have been some things that Armin has said that I disagreed with. Um, but I can't remember what it was. <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> um, Couldn't have been that bad. Sorry, too much, too much pressure. No, it's okay I if mean, it's bad. Pressure so much as like I mean if I can't think of it right now it must not have been like that important right mm-hmm. I mean but also I don't know the full catalog of everything you guys have ever done right, I'm right. sure if I like really went through it I would find something but yeah. Um, oh yeah not like straight off the top of my head right a lot of our, yeah. one, one thing I like about our patrons and I say this just to uh, to convince the other ones not to abandon us as well is that a lot of them have significant disagreements with me or Ali and they still set and they still stick by us. So I really like that. Yeah. I really like that about our patrons and the patrons that are not like that. I'm just saying that so that I could make them also not quit. (laughs) Just try to be like, look at these other patrons that are not quitting, but go on Ali. Sorry. Read that. Yeah. Yeah. 
So uh, Erin is asking also, uh, she said, how did you become comfortable with your gender fluidity? Did you simply decide you didn't need a label? She's not asking gen- for are you a gender friend. Fluid? I think bisexuality and gender fluidity are completely different. Well, no, I did mention briefly that oh, for a while I was okay. very confused about my gender. Um, but that wasn't I mean, biological. That was because of your the work, the cult that you were with. Was it biological? <laughs> Basically, I mean... It's hard to say. Maybe one day I'll I'll, I'll feel differently. Right now, I feel comfortable calling myself a woman. Um, for a while, oh god, so complicated. Um, I guess I would just how I became comfortable with it when I did feel that way. I would I would dress differently. I'm generally someone who has a very tomboyish like butch kind of style um so i kind of embraced that more i went by different pronouns briefly um i surrounded myself well i mean my friends were all very supportive when i did feel that way oh okay um so but by the way i wasn't uh, denying just to be clear to our audience i wasn't denying that gender fluidity is not a thing for some people but there's yeah. two different forms of like it's one thing for you to be gender fluid because you're you're just like that biologically, and there's another thing to be confused confused about your gender because people constantly tell you that there's no such thing as gender, right? So those are I two agree, separate. But I think it is important to point out because one thing that I hate about the gay community um, is um, you know it's not just gay, LGBT, whatever, whatever. Um, is this whole born this way thing. Hmm. And it's like, I was born this way. This taking on of it as an immutable characteristic. Hmm. When it shouldn't matter if you were born this way or not. Exactly. It's, yeah. It shouldn't matter. It's 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 personal expression. Well, and it, it shouldn't it, matter. If it, in the if way- it was a choice. If it was a choice, hmm. I should be able to express that the same way regardless. Yeah, but it shouldn't matter with regards to whether we should accept you and whether you should be expressed, but it does matter in some other ways. Like, for example, if being gay was a choice, if it was a choice, it shouldn't matter the f- like because they're still not hurting anybody. So if you could be gay and you, that would be a choice, it shouldn't, because it's a choice, people shouldn't take your right away to be gay and you shouldn't be treated differently because you chose to be gay. But if it, w- it matters in some other aspects, if it's a choice or not, right? Like it may, it, it, it will completely change the, our understanding of <laughs> how, um, you know, sexual orientation works and what it means for, for, for our mind. Like it really would matter um, regarding our understanding of how the brain works and how um, psychological effects of that. But when it comes to treatment of people in that, only in that specific area, yeah, it shouldn't matter. Only, yeah. in, only in regards to rights and treatment, it shouldn't matter. But in every other aspect, it does matter. Does it? Okay. Except I don't, I don't think that um, not being straight is always biologically derived. Well, I mean, not. Yeah, I agree with that. And whether that's true or not. It's important, I think. Whether, I'm not, whether, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, so not always, most of the time, people are at one of the end of the spectrum. But whether that's reality or not, whether that's biological or not, that is a very important question. And the answer to that question matters. It doesn't, the only per- place where it doesn't matter is on the, ma- on the place where, you know, in the, where, if we're talking about how to treat people and what rights you do enjoy and do we blame you for any things that you want and things that you don't want in that area it shouldn't matter but that doesn't mean that we this is not an important question we're talking uh, about it the also human, doesn't mean we're talking about the human mind of course it matters how it, how things work like if we say it, like it also if, doesn't... if somebody comes up if somebody hold on if somebody comes up with an explanation for why we choose different co- why we have different favorite colors like why somebody's favorite color is green and someone else's favorite color is blue if somebody figures that out and somebody comes up with a different answer that is that's important like if we need to know how this ha- like if 
that knowing that the answer to that question teaches a lot of, teaches us a lot about how the human mind works. So it does matter, but just because it matters, that doesn't mean people who like blue are in, are superior to the people who like green or anything like that, or that they should be right, treated yeah. differently. That's I I gotta say, I, the first of all, biologically doesn't necessarily mean genetic. Genetic doesn't necessarily mean biological. Right. right. And just because it's not bio, even if it's not biological, not genetic, doesn't mean it's still a choice. Right? It doesn't have to be. There's many things that are not choices. Right? Like people who are, this is not a comparison, by the way, but, but you know, people who are mm -hmm. pedophiles, a lot of times it's not a choice for them. Is it biological? Yes. Who knows? Nobody knows. But it's not necess It's not a choice. If it was a choice, they'd never do it. Right? So, I guess so that's. This would be a disagreement I have. Mm -hmm. I, I'm giving you pushback because I've studied a lot, I mean, in my literal minor that I pursued. Um, a lot of these studies about seemingly biological or inherent markers towards non-heterosexual proclivities. Right. And the methodology is very shaky. I don't, mm. I don't think these are the best studies that we could have to support that. That's uh, Sure, I, I get that. And I, I think that there's a lot of, uh, there are many correlations. Like, you know, many mm -hmm. other mammalian species are, Anyway, that's a, that's a different uh, conversation, so I'm not going to go down. But do that you, okay, that was a disagreement yet, with Ali. Exactly. But do you agree that the answer, it does matter which answer is correct? That was a disagreement with you. <laughs> oh really? So what? But but my yeah, I, th I thought but, we were okay. On the same but thing I think I think I didn't explain myself well. I'm not in favor of I'm not in favor of what is the correct I mean, answer. One sentence. I'm not one saying sentence. which answer is the correct answer. All I'm saying is that. It matters, and we have to figure it out. Whether okay. it's biological or not biological, where is it's a choice or not a choice, I don't know. I'm not an expert. I'm not a scientist. I'm not making a claim on whether, whether which studies show what because I haven't done any research on that. All I'm saying is that how much of it is biological and how much, it's, how much of it is not biological, it's an important thing to figure out. I kind of agree with that because I'm I, as a science guy. I think everything matters. Everything is because you never know what's going to come out of it. We never know what's going to come out of it. There may be something beneficial that comes out of finding mm -hmm. out things. Mm -hmm. Like you know Faraday when he messed around with copper wires and magnets. He wasn't thinking, oh, you know, one day we're going to have like electric motors and all these machines. And he wasn't thinking that. He was like, oh, let me just see what happens when I mix these two things together. So all he was thinking. And then all this great stuff came out of it. So it's always good to pursue science for the sake of pursuing science and to find out more things. And in that sense, you know, I think it matters. I'm starting to realize that part of this is what I was taught in college as well, is that critical gender studies scholars are vehemently and vitriolically opposed to the scientific study of these things. Hmm. They, they're, they're almost offended by it. It's, it, they're, there are lots of portions of critical gender studies that are yeah. actually anti-science. Um, and I, maybe that's like that part of my education speaking up. Um, th they have this worry that if we look for these things biologically, that people are basically going to use it as biological screening. Like they're worried about like almost a eugenics, like a gay abortion scenario. Mm -hmm. One thing that you but, do that you know is very... Oh, oh, wait, well, wait, wait. No. Uh, Armin, I, one thing I just okay. want to say for all of the people, because most of the people who say this stuff are religious people, right? Religious people say, well, you know, being gay is not a choice. Is it a choice? Is that? It really matters to them. But you know what is a choice? Being religious or not religious. If you get rights based on whether you're religious or not religious, right? And yes, you are indoctrinated and that happens, but you can convert out of a religion. It's not biologically ingrained. So well, I mean, if, if you that is, free will. if you get protected rights based on being religious, right, then why can't you get protected rights based on being something that is that definitely has some level of biological um, ideology, right, yeah. compared to religion, right? So it's it is, just, it's way more immutable than. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Anyway, we one thing I want to point out to our oh, yeah, audience. Yeah, one thing I want to point out is the one thing you do that I. I, I I wish I could do it as good as you do, is that you try so to worse. find this, you, sh you keep trying to find the source of your biases and you just like do like an analysis of, on your own way of thinking. That's, uh, I haven't, that's, you do it very well. So, and I don't do it. I've often. been in, mm -hmm. I've been in therapy since I was fucking <laughs> 15. <laughs> right. Okay. Right, right. It's, it's great. Been yeah. trained to do.
Okay, sorry. Yeah. yeah um. Yeah. So a blonde infidel saying awesome discussion. Uh, Aaron Jones. Well, she's saying his book, The Cult of. Oh, so this is Steve Hassan. Uh, Steve Hassan mm-hmm. that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. His book. He has also has a book called The Cult, the Cult of Trump, mm-hmm. uh, which is really analyzes how Trump uses mind control, Came and he discusses that. Yeah. So that's another book of his that she says that. is eerily fascinating. Um, uh, and then, you know, get more. You need Hassan on the show. He's brilliant. So, yeah, definitely going to uh, reach out to him. Omeima, Omeima, the great Omeima. Yay, so, yay. Omeima. For those of you, I watched yeah, her episode. She's, it was awesome. Yes. I know. And she's so brilliant. Power yeah, she's the one. Yeah, she's just really, really smart. Yeah, okay, anyway. I, I said that last time. She's saying, loving this discussion. Susanna is so thoughtful and articulate. She's describing my own experience so well. I joined the social socialist alternative for a while, but got scared off pretty quickly. But I really relate to that desperation to burn down every structure, hierarchy, and tradition mm-hmm. because of how much you've seen religion and culture cause uh, through these mechanisms. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That and desire to destroy that source of your own pain at any cost can mm-hmm. lead you in some not so constructive directions. Yeah, she's saying that, uh, so she continues, she says, I even identified as an anarchist for a hot mm-hmm. minute. I still feel the same way about tradition, but don't believe leftists are approaching it in a constructive way at all. I completely agree, that's exactly. 100%. Oh, yeah. before I forget, completely we have to be very that. clear. We ta- when we're not, I mean, I, was, I wasn't saying she was saying that, but we're not, I hope most of our audience already knows, but if anybody is listening to this that is not, uh, this new to our podcast, we're not anti-left or anti-right, okay? Like, we're talking about a fringe movement within the left uh, yeah. group. I know a lot, most people here in the li- live chat already know that, but I just have to clarify this because we didn't even mention that once. Most leftist people and yeah. most right-wing people are very chill uh, and you know, a lot, there's a lot of good thinkers on the left and there's a lot of great thinkers on the right. And the far right and the woke left does not represent the majority of people on either side. Why do you say What's good funny? for the left and great for the right, Armin? <laughs> that shows you that you are a Nazi sympathizer. Yeah. By the way, I I'm a leftist. Yeah, as well. I'm a leftist. So I'm leftist, and I can't I can't stand I, the woke cult. I think so, I'm a leftist. Yeah, left. Yeah, so oh my god, it was you really don't funny. have to be. Yeah. <laughs> when when I was really into this way of thinking, I thought that this is how you do leftism correctly. Mm. Like, if you're not doing what we're doing, you're not really serious about what you say you're serious about. Yeah, you're like, the Salafis of the left. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, you gotta do it you're like tech-fearing. You're tech-fearing everybody else. That's a, uh, you know, tech oh, No, that is what it is. Yes. <laughs> 100%. Um, there, is, there is a pathological demand for purity um it was really funny when you guys did the ask me anything last month um and armin was talking about being a free market capitalist and uh libertarian i was like he's so canceled (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's right so if if you told me that I'd be like talking to like a free market capitalist, I would have been like, no. <laughs> All right, just to be clear though, with regards to the markets and stuff like that, I I do oh, think that a lot of people with opinions on the economy they they just simplify it, like if like I hold my views on the economy a lot loose more loosely than my views on God and religion, because I don't think people understand how complicated this is. Like greater thinkers than all of us here have been struggling to figure out what's the best way to run markets and the economy, and the, this that this shit is complicated, man. Like, like I, this is not like oh, oh God is not real. Of course, there's no evidence, or like this is not that simple. So I think the people that are passionately disagreeing with each other and like the leftists that think like the free cut the the people that believe in socialism and they think all the capitalists are idiots and the capitalists that believe all the socialists are idiots they're all idiots for thinking the other side is idiot because there are greater thinkers than all of them that are still haven't figured this out so i don't know why you're so married to your position like one thing i i suggest people both capitalists and socialists to be charitable to each other to understand that ca- the capitalists the reason why they're capitalists is because this they think this is the best for most people and they want people mm-hmm. to be happy 
And the socialists said the reason why they're socialists is that they think that this is the best for most people. And they also want more, more people to be happy. Okay? So yeah. at least give that to each other. But go on. Okay. So, yeah. So last comment, last question here. Because we're coming up to like over two hours now. So uh, Jeremy Frank is saying, uh, Yasmin's story on Sam Harris's podcast was also what got me to look into the ex-Muslim movement. And the reaction of that judge hit me really hard as well. So I think um, that that really, really did. Um, she's done a great service by sharing it's, her it's story. It's incredible because it, it really is the perfect mirror to say, look at yourself. This happened in North America. This happened in your backyard. And you excused it. And you said it was okay. Because they yeah. come from this group and they come from over there. And mm. it's 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 unexcusable to yeah. it's 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 unexcusable. And you, to can, allow you cannot child abuse. you cannot deny that. Yeah. It's yeah, to allow child abuse just because, well, it's an Egyptian family, so that's how they do it in their culture. So let that kid you know, be t uh, hung upside down and hit on the bottoms of her feet. But if it was a white kid, we wouldn't, right? And that is that is racism. That's a racism. So if you get that, if you get so, that, why is why is it that other people don't get that? Like when they see something like this. Like, what is the barrier? Is it ignorance or? Yeah, w why didn't you get it before when you were in the? Far no, but when you saw something... it, you got it right away. Is because. If you buy into identity politics, hmm. she's allowed to talk about it. Right. It's because she's a brown woman who comes from an immigrant family of a religious minority. Hmm. She's allowed to voice this. I right. mean, I hate to put it that bluntly. Right, right. Do, do you think but you, it really is like that? Do you think you still have some of those biases when it comes to identity politics? Do you still, like, do you, if you listen to a brown man talking about something, do you feel like okay this is i like this more than if a white white man was saying the same thing you know like a little oh, bit of, i mean yeah. i i i'm way better at catching myself in it now and mm -hmm. i can i can immediately recalibrate but like when i first was you know like exploring random atheist thinkers or whatever mm -hmm. like i ran of course into hitchens harris dawkins and i saw what they had to say about islam and I didn't even want to read anything else they produced because I had the Ben Affleck reaction 100%. I have to be honest with you guys. Hmm. I was literally like, oh, they're gross and racist. And I completely dismissed what they had to say until I found what you guys had to say. And hmm. I have to own up to that. Hmm. Luckily, nowadays, yeah. I can. But Yeah, I wonder and it's, I it's also a different time. Like, that. like about 10 years ago, the way that that whole movement was and it, it has a lot to do with the, the political situation too like you know the way the way that it was when those books came out in 2004 2005 2006 and at that time it was a very different conversation and they it had a massive in, impact like the atheists just came out in droves it was very different nowadays when people look at that when they come across that at the first time they see the criticism of islam with donald trump and the far right rising and you know all of those attacks on mosques in new zealand and the, all of the it, it's a completely different context and it feels Wait, very to demonstrate to this mm -hmm. i have to show you guys to the audio listeners i am holding up a hijabi barbie pencil case oh <laughs> the, the iron, i bought this at a chinese dollar store <laughs> nice. it's the craziest thing ever and i was like oh hijabi barbie like how cute i have to have diversity it. Amazing. I remember giving a presentation in my psychology of sexuality class about genital mutilation and referring to it explicitly as cutting. Hmm. Yeah, you have to because that's that's acceptable somehow, you know? Yeah, because okay, who so are we to put our judgment on it as exactly. mutilation? Wow. It's, it's reprehensible. Evil, so, um, do you okay, feel the same question. way about male? Like, do you also think like uh, male circumcision is also evil? I, I don't think it should be controversial to say that a value or culture that does, yeah, a culture that does not value um, cutting up baby parts is superior, regardless mm -hmm. of gender. Good. Okay, great. Wow. That was, 
I've never heard it explained like that. But yeah, okay, good. Okay, good. Yeah, there's so okay. many, there's so many quote worthy. Go. There's so many quote worthy um, statements from Susanna that we could yeah. meme. If we had meme, yeah. somebody should take it notes. But go on, Ellie. Yeah. So yeah, last question. Then we gotta go. Susanna uh, from Blonde and Fidel. Has Susanna had face to face conversations with her peers about this? Does she have any good friendships she's worried about losing? Oh, one hundred percent. When this goes public, people will likely just disassociate from me and not even tell me so. Hey, Is just that what are you? Mm, yes, because there's a lot of people I love and a lot of people I care about. Um, mm, uh. But hopefully, they will engage me in conversation if they feel like I misrepresented things. In fact, if they feel like I misrepresented the movement. I think they should come talk to you guys about it and correct the record. Um, and I think that if someone has a problem with what I've said, I would love to be proven wrong. I would love that what yeah. I have observed to actually be not true because what I've observed really concerns me. See, this is one of the unique things about this movement compared to all the other movements that we have to deal with, right? We have a lot of problems with Islam. And Muslims are ready to talk about it with us. We have a lot of yes. problems with Christianity, Hinduism, Judaism, um, far right. Oh, yeah, from the far right, there are people lining up to, to come tell us why we're wrong and we, to, to, to talk to them about it, to be like, yeah, challenge, hey, okay, come convince me why I shouldn't be a racist, right? Um, sure. they're, people, they're just willing to listen, right? They, they don't, they're not like, oh, I'm not going to talk to you. Um, they okay, hate right, the right. most, but um, but this is a this is a unique feature. I mean, can I don't know if there's any other examples. I, I I'm pretty sure you can find Muslims that are not willing to talk to coffers or Christians that are not willing to. But but there are also a whole bunch of them. The vast majority of their activists are the point of they're like, yeah, I'm an activist. I'm supposed to talk to people, right? But the activists of the woke cult. Is it like, no, we're not going to talk to you. Like, it's so... That's why the de-radicalization of this group is a little bit... Um, it plays into um, aspects of collective guilt. You become poisoned by the farthest right person that you talk about mm. uh, or talk to. Um, and it's brought me to the point where I go out of my way to talk to people that I disagree with. I go try to do street epistemology on the black Hebrew Israelites downtown. You do? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what? It does not go over well. <laughs> we, we, yeah, so you'd absolutely definitely need to start a YouTube channel you, and have like... Uh, uh, we could have an entire episode on just that experience. On you, just that, yeah. Um, oh, Judy, so much... You Guys, what? Uh, what, what, what? No, no, wait. You're gonna say something. What? You so what? I don't even. I, I can't even start. I can't even start because there's just too much material there. <laughs> yeah. What? So we'll save that for we'll we'll save that for the next time. Yeah. Judy Flattery, uh, um, Judy. From Santa Barbara. Yeah. She's saying, uh, please include a list of uh, all the papers, books, authors, and podcasts that were recommended in this episode in the notes and description. So oh, if yeah. you could send me that, I'm gonna put them up in the description here. Um, and Mars is also yep. saying, Susanna, just start your own podcast. This is needed. Omema is saying, yes, I second Judy's request. So many resources mentioned. Uh, and pretty much everybody wants you to start something. They think that you're a way to saying fascinating discussion. Susanna so intelligent and articulate. So thank you very much for coming on. Where can people find you? There's a lot of people going to want to follow you and find you online. Are you on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, anything like that? Um, well, deleting Twitter was the best decision I ever made in my life. Um, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can find me on um, Instagram is where I'm most likely to actually talk oh, really? to you. Um, I'm only on Facebook for the Secular Jihadist group. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, my uh, handle on Instagram is triple dimpled, um, like as in three dimples because. When I give you like a real smile, I have three dimples. Uh, <laughs> so, so what? T R I P L E, D I M P L E. That one. Oh yeah, I like see that? you. Do I follow you? Oh no. Follow no, me. I follow you. Follow um, okay. I am following you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. And um, yeah, that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. 
Um, wait, before we end, I wanted to tell you guys something that I wrote down. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, that I wanted to make sure to express to you guys. Um, this is, uh, very rarely in our little human lives do we get the opportunity to pers personally express our gratitude to those thinkers and activists who challenge us to expand our minds and transform our way of thinking. I want to thank you for the meaningful opportunity to do just this. The best way that I can repay you is not to support you in silence, but to continue to speak on what I believe to be true, to believe to be the truth based on evidence, no matter how uncomfortable it may be, and despite the possibility of social repercussions. And I hope I can tell you so in person one day. Aww, that was Thank so you. Great. That's Aww. amazing. That was, I love that. Thank Dude, you. Sweet. And, and definitely, yeah, please come back. And it's totally mutual. And we're totally going to become patrons of your podcast too whenever you start it. And yes. hopefully you do soon. Oh my so. God. <laughs> I don't even yeah yeah no, no it's going to be good you need to um, alright so everybody uh, who is here I mean this is an amazing episode so um, Mars is saying bring her back Blonde yes. Infidel thank you Darko Matt Rhodes um, uh, who else Judy Aaron obviously Sohan D'Souza uh, Omeima uh, Wayne Robert all of you guys, thank you very much for joining us, and then we're gonna see you next time. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Love you guys. Stay on. The yeah, stay on. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. just... <laughs> Bye. Okay. The secular jihadists have been made possible thanks to the Illuminati and the covert support of Israel and the CIA. That's what we have been told, but we haven't received our checks yet. If you like what we do, please support us. Share the podcast with your friends. Write and tweet us with topic and guest suggestions. Or head over to secularjihadist.com and give a dollar or more for exclusive access to live video. Have your questions read and answered on the air and more. Till next time, may the flying spaghetti monster be with you.